educated economist here. So we're talking about the jobs market today and how everybody who had gone through the great resignation and going to get the better job with the bonus pay and all that are turning out to not really like their job. And, um, you know, that's not a surprise to me. You know, when people are jumping ship, you know, and running to another job, basically for higher pay or for that bonus or maybe even for like status or something like that, like they got this high status job. Not always are you doing that for the right reasons. Like, you know, is this a job that you really enjoy? You know, is it a job that is going to be close to your location, making it convenient for you, like close to where you live? You know, these are like a lot of things that some people just don't think about. I mean, even I myself, you know, I was lived very close to work. I could walk to work. Well, now I live about 20 minutes away. And it's amazing me like how much gas I use now. Even in my, you know, old 99 Toyota Corolla, I still go through a lot of gas, a lot more than I used to. Obviously, only living five minutes from, from work. So it makes a huge difference just on that location. But something that I found like, pretty interesting within this article is to think, okay, 80% of the people who have switched jobs are disappointed with their decision. Like they really miss their old friends, you know, the old coworkers that they, that they used to work with or the location or whatever, you know, maybe even had better, you know, maybe like health benefits or something like that. Some of these things that they're, they're now missing. And I think about it, it was just like 80% of these people no longer like the position that they have. And I think like most of my life, like I think about the people that I worked with and the jobs that I had and the places that I worked. And if I was to kind of give a guess, I would say that 80% of the time, everybody hated their job, like didn't like being there. Like there was a better place that they would rather have been than to be at work, right? It might not have been like hate. I guess I shouldn't go that far. But as far as like enjoying the day being there, no, like everybody would rather be at home than to be at work. The only reason why they're at work is so they can earn the money. So it's not like a place that you're going to enjoy going to. Like, you know, you might enjoy some of the days, you might enjoy some of the people, but there's a million other things you would rather be doing than go to work. And I think that would be the case for 80% of the people, regardless if you, you know, did the, did the went through the great resignation and got a different job. So that's some of the things that I think about, like when I read this article, it was like, you know, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. I think 80% of the people don't like their jobs anyway, regardless of that. You know, I think about the first job that I got, um, working at a lumberyard in high school, part time. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Like all of a sudden, like I had money to like gas money. I could go out money and go, you know, I could do stuff. And I thought having a job was the coolest thing in the world. Like, I didn't care what stocking shelves, no problem. You know, what do you want me to do? I'll do whatever you want. And it was a good time. Like, I loved having the job. And then I moved out, like moved out of my house the day I graduated high school. I'd already had an apartment. You know, we, uh, my, well, she was my girlfriend at the time, but my wife now, Sarah, she moved into that apartment, was in high school working. You know, we were making the rent payments. And to me, I'm like, man, here, we're going to just go off and just like really awesome, man. We both have jobs. We're going to go out there. We're going to make it. You know, we're going to have our own place and do our own thing. And about four months later, we had like no money, like no money, hardly could pay any bills. It was just like everything was like month to month was like. I mean, it wasn't even close. Like, we were completely out of money all the time. In fact, we lived off of leftover buffet pizza because she worked at a pizza restaurant. And she would bring home the leftover buffet pizza what wasn't eaten, you know, sitting under these, those hot lights for hours. That's what we would eat. That's what we lived off of for like a year. I mean, we ate so much leftover dried out pizza that I didn't eat pizza for like, and I love pizza. I didn't eat pizza for like five years after that. I was like, no, thank you. I am not interested in that stuff. But, you know, that's how it went, you know, and we stuck it out with those jobs for years, years and years. And the longer you work at the job, you know, the better positions you get and the more pay you get. And eventually, you know, we were able to drive nicer cars and move into a better place and stuff like that. And so I think about that, like, you know, how you conduct yourselves within your own job. Like, you know, if you get higher pay, then generally you increase your standard of living. 
But if you get a higher pay and then you maintain the standard of living that you have, well, pretty soon, you know, you start building up a savings and you're, you got the emergency funds and, you know, you start feeling a lot better about, you know, just life in general. And so when you start feeling better about life in general, then you feel better about your job, right? Then pretty soon you start liking your job again. Well, that's the way it was for me. Like, you know, it went from like, man, we're struggling really hard. I can't make my payments. I'm kind of pissed at my job because they don't pay me enough and I work every day and I still don't have it. And then pretty soon I worked up to a point where it was just like, hey, you know, I actually have a little bit of money here and, you know, my standard of living has increased a little bit. Well, then pretty soon you're like, well, I want the new truck. I want the new stuff. And you start increasing your standard of living to match your pay. And then pretty soon you're stuck in that position again where you're like, oh, man. I can't leave this job because it pays me too much. Like, where am I going to go? The benefits are too good, all this other stuff. So now you feel stuck again. And you start hating your job, right? Because now you're making all like, you know, making these debt payments and everything else because you've tried to condition your life to enjoy the standard of living from the increase of money. And, you know, that's kind of the experience that I had with it, too. So it's kind of like an up and down comparatively to how you are conducting your life with the job that you have now. Even here, the job that I have today, like when I got this job, I was really broke. I was deeply in debt. I had hardly anything going on, broken down cars, stuff like that. And it was very difficult to make it to work, let alone just work here, but just to show up. And so trying to show up and then trying to be motivated and trying to get all the stuff like, you know, it's very difficult and it's very stressful on your life. Right? And that's pretty much the way it was for me until i started getting a little bit more in the side gigs like i started calling bingo a little you know getting a little bit better at bingo as far as you know the the tips that would come in and stuff like that and you know started the bingo or the the youtube channel and so like i had some side income starting to come in and you know i found that going to work was a lot easier right i didn't rely on the job like i did rely on the job but having the side income made it easier like everything became you know, just easier in general, like you had the cash for it. So all of a sudden, it wasn't like all of a sudden, but, you know, as you have the side gigs, well, the job doesn't seem so stressful anymore and you start enjoying the job again. So really, it's not the job that I feel like, you know, I mean, it might be the job. I mean, you might work in a place that sucks or whatever, and the people suck and the job sucks or whatever. But for the most part, if it's a decent job and decent people and OK pay, it's probably your life in general that has you stressed out about work and therefore you don't like work. You associate it with like, man, if my job only paid me more, if my boss was cool or whatever, I would be in a better position. And I think that's where I think a lot of people are probably sitting right now. If you think about like some of the things that are said inside of these articles here, but that's kind of the way I seen it from my experience with it. And then now you got like Jerome Powell out there saying that these awesome hot jobs reports, you know, was it the, best jobs market in 54 years or something like that. I mean, it's just like, I don't even know if I really trust these jobs numbers or anything with it, but you know, we're going with the article here and what the federal reserve is going to do considering that this information is coming out. So they say, Hey, with all these jobs, it's most likely that that's going to keep inflation up. You know, we're going to have to keep the interest rates elevated due to the fact that the wage competition is going to continue to bring input costs going into the products that we buy and sell right the the services and stuff so if the wages are up then inflation is probably going to be up too so if the wages could come down or at least the jobs like the the competition for jobs if that was to come down then that would be a sign for the federal reserve that hey you know, our efforts are actually succeeding here and hopefully the inflation will come down, not just disinflation, but actually deflation in a sense that they get it to their 2% target and maybe even below that to bring the long-term average inflation rate to that 2%, which is not something a lot of people talk about that average inflation over time. So I think about that. If there's good hot jobs market, like, you know, the wage growth is probably going to continue. And then on top of that, the Federal Reserve doesn't like that, right? They're wanting to see less jobs out there, and that would be a sign to them that they are succeeding. 
And then on top of that, I didn't find the, the article for it. I just saw the headline, but something about Biden's administration, something about creating jobs. And I'm thinking, well, that's not what the Federal Reserve wants, is it? You know, like Biden wants to get the public's approval by saying, hey, we're getting jobs for you. Everybody loves jobs, right? But then the Federal Reserve's like, no, we, we don't want jobs right now. Jobs are the problem. So it's pretty funny watching all that go down. All right, what are y'all talking about? Got 159 of you up in here. We got 47 likes. Please go hit that thumbs up when you get into the chat here. That way the YouTube uh, algorithm will pick up the, ch the uh, video and start spreading it around for everybody to see. All right. I started a channel, The Self-Educated Economist. <laughs> right on. Good evening from Lakeland, Florida. Right on. Do you... Do you all feel that the U.S. is too expensive or no? Um, well, I think that's probably, I mean, too expensive. That's all relative, like, to how much money you earn to, you know, to everything. But, yeah, the, the United States is expensive, but there's not everywhere in the United States is expensive. Like, I remember Astoria used to be, like, a working-class town. Like, you could rent apartments here with a regular job and have a regular life and stuff. And now it's... It, it's moved up like I, I didn't even realize it was happening like I see it now but like at the time I didn't I didn't notice like the money moving in and the expenses going up and everything becoming you know more difficult to to try and live day to day you know with like renting an apartment and buying food and all the other stuff that goes with it, it I realized almost a story is no longer like the working class town it's kind of a almost like a ritzy town kind of thing a trendy town you know? and so yeah I mean I guess it's relative to where you're at uh, I think people hate that their job isn't allowing them freedom. Right, and that's where the money comes in. Working for the sake of being a slave. Yeah, and that's that's really what it ultimately comes down to. I mean, if you work nine to five, eight hours a day, five days a week, you know, every single week of the month, and at the end of the month, you hardly have any money to do anything with. You just make your rent payment. You just pay your bills. You know, maybe get the car payment and insurance done, and that's it. You're, it it's all gone, right? And now what? No matter what you do, it doesn't feel any better for you. Like, you can cut a little bit of expenses, and what do you end up with? You know, you might be able to save 50 bucks or something by, you know, cutting back on your cable or something like that. There's, there's not a lot you can do once you get down to that, like, you know, basic standard of living like you know you just have your basic living and you're still not making it that's where having side income right that that was the only way that i could do it like i it didn't matter if i was making 15 dollars an hour or if i was making 30 dollars an hour framing it didn't matter how much money i was earning it never was enough ever right but if i could figure out my life off of a nine to five it was like okay my nine to five job covers the bills covers the insurance covers everything that i need how do I get more money for myself, right? And that's where the side incomes came in. That's where I started doing, you know, work on the weekends for somebody or like I said, do, you know, do call and bingo or, you know, eventually got the YouTube channel. But it was that side income that really made the difference because you weren't counting on it. It's like it was extra almost. And if you had this extra, well, or once a week or every other week or something, it, it gave you that relief, you know, and that felt good. All right. Uh, let's see. I hope everyone has had a good week thus far. Well, I hope so too, Joe. Okay, well, let's see. It seems worth it to homestead if you can actually survive. I'd probably end up like Chris Macken, Macken, Mac Handles. Huh. Uh, I hope everyone here is prepared as they can be for whatever may happen. In the coming months or years, yeah, and that's the the hardest part. I mean, how do you prepare for the unexpected? I mean, prepare for what? You know, like, are you prepared for food shortages? Are you prepared for you know power grids going out? Are you you know what are you preparing for? It's uh, you know, it's it's anybody's guess. I mean, a lot of people are preparing by getting ammunition and food and medical supplies and stuff like that. Um, probably not a bad idea you know I think I mean honestly I think probably the best thing that you can do to prepare is to learn to can get canning supplies you know it's it's a matter of being able to preserve your food like you can have a bunch of food stored you know like I got six months worth of food or whatever but then you got to bail 
you got to bail out. Now what? Right? Now you have an issue that you have to deal with because you got to pack this six months with the food with you. If with just a handful of canning supplies, jars, lids, rings, and I mean it is a little bit of bulk, but you don't need that many, right? You can reuse the jars. So being in a prepping position in which that you can preserve food without electricity or anything like that, I think that is probably one of the greatest skills to have, you know, um, especially for prepping purposes going into like uncertain times. Yeah. All right. All nighter up in here. Good evening, all nighter. All right. Is it possible that working class become the victims? They are now survive serving others who don't work. So the ones who don't work win. Now the working class can become the victims to the to the victims. Yeah, I mean, I think that separation between the rich and the poor is just going to continue to grow. I mean, what ends up happening is is that you have like this working class of people, right? And we had this really super strong middle class back when we were a manufacturing powerhouse because we were exporting all this stuff to the world and the world was sending us their dollars or sending, not necessarily their dollars, but their money, right? And when they send us their money, that increases our standard of living. We were really enjoying all this new money coming in. So what ended up happening is, is that as we were enjoying that new money and we started importing more luxuries, more foreign imports and exporting our manufacturing, that's what started driving that wedge, right? We started losing our middle class because basically we were no longer manufacturing like we once were. So when we have nothing but new money pouring in due to debt, like, I mean, this is kind of fast forwarding through the story because as this, you know, wealth, wealth gap continued to grow, eventually it gets to a point where we just have new money coming in from the issuance of debt. So the people at the very top who have access to that money, they're the ones who are going to be separated from everybody else who is trying to work for the money to pay it off, to pay off their debts and stuff. So you end up with a separation between the rich and the poor. And the problem with it is, is that it, you can't really bring back the middle class. Like in order to bring back the middle class, you'd have to bring that manufacturing back. In order to bring the manufacturing back, you would have to stop bringing in the luxuries, which basically means stop importing all this foreign stuff. And if we stop importing all the foreign stuff, we don't have anything to sell to each other. And then we all start falling into poverty. So I don't see any way that the middle class is going to come back. Like it only just gets worse, you know, as the separation continues. And then even the people at the middle class are working really hard and they're like, you know, we're not much better off than the people who aren't working at all. Like, why are we working? I don't get it. You know, and this is really where the problem is, because if you had a strong middle class where people could work like an individual person could provide enough income to build an entire household, like to provide for, you know, the wife, the kids, the cars, the food, the everything that you need out of a single income. Well, that's a strong middle class, right? That doesn't, that's not even remotely close to the case anymore. And I don't see how that's ever going to return. So it's just going to be that widening part. And then the middle class is going to be like just slightly better than people who don't work, you know, just slightly. Uh, good call, Tom. A few fulfilled or content. All right. Ron Hubbard. Hi. He says, hi, Simon. Okay. Uh, I love my job, work for old employer, 2,500 miles away, grateful, I work from home, only charge the hours I work. Oh, that's pretty cool. People are pissed because company paying too little and landlords charge too much. Well, that is not the problem of the companies. Right. Because right now there is wage competition like crazy. Right. They're paying as much or giving out bonuses. They're doing all kinds of stuff. So is it the company's not paying enough? No, that's that's not the case. Right. And is it the landlords charging too much? Well, no. Right. I mean, they're in competition just like everybody else. There's supply and demand. I mean, why would they take a lower rent to benefit you? Right. I mean, you got to think this is their business. I mean, they're not in it so that you can have a good time. They're in it so they can have a good time. And so to say, like, you know, the landlords charge too much. They charge what is appropriate. What is in competition? I mean, is it high? Yeah. Is it fair? I don't know. I mean, what's fair? Fair isn't fair. There's no, no such thing as fair. So, no, there's never going to be a time when a company is going to pay you enough. And the rent is always going to be too high. I mean, think about that Roman tablet that I that I refer to about the guy who, <coughs> excuse me, who uh, 
carved into this marble tablet about the conditions of his life. You know, the con major concerns that he had and the major concerns, you know, what do I, what do, where do I get my next meal? What happens if I get sick? How do I pay the rent? Right. I mean, these are things that will never change. I don't care. Like you can I don't, if you're looking for a politician or a system or something out there that is going to come in and say, hey, you can just work your average job and you're going to have a wonderful life. It ain't happening. That's that like that doesn't happen. Like it could happen to somebody who just happened to luckily like make the right decisions, didn't go deep into debt, just worked an average job and was able to be fine with it. Most people are not going to do that. Most people are going to struggle their entire life like that's it right and you know that's basically what i did i mean you know it's not a matter of just going and having a nine to five job you know that's going to do it for you you're going to have your life that's it like i don't care what company you work for i don't care what it is you're doing <coughs> you'll get your life off of that but if you want anything more, if you want something more in life, you got to do that on your own. I mean, you have got to break away from the nine to five, from working for that employer. You either have to do something for yourself or figure out a way that's beyond that. Because if you are clocking in, if you are working nine to five, it doesn't matter. There is not enough hours in the day. It doesn't like it doesn't matter if you're getting paid fifteen dollars an hour or fifty dollars an hour. There's simply not enough time in the day to earn an, an extreme amount of money, right? You have to be able to leverage your time. Doing like things like YouTube is awesome because I can make a video and then the video goes out there and earns money while I'm, you know, hanging out with my family or something. You know, having a business where you can maybe hire employees or something like that. Doing affiliate sales. I mean, there is all kinds of ways to make money out there. It's just, you gotta figure it out. And generally when you're doing that, in the early days, you don't make a lot. So you have to work a lot and not get paid. But then eventually you get to a point where you can put out videos and get paid or something. You know? um, I'm happy to be working again only two days a week, 10 hours. I'd rather do something else. But it feels good making money again after 15 years forced retirement. Yeah, you're going to get bored with anything eventually. That's right. I mean, you really do. Like, it doesn't matter what it is you're doing like you might be finding like like you know you get a new car you're like super excited man this is the best car ever i'm gonna be so happy with this car and then three years later like man i wish i had a different kind of car you know this car's getting old it doesn't yeah it doesn't do it for me anymore you know you just get kind of used to things and then they get boring you're right yeah uh uh bro you just admitted you could afford and a on your first job yeah I could, you know, I lived in a, I live, okay, so I could afford a job or afford an apartment with my first job, right? I had a full-time job. I was making 25 cents over minimum wage, $4.75 an hour, right? This was uh, mid to mid, mid 1990s, right? It was very tough to find a job, like really, really hard. Okay. And so when I did get a job, I was thankful to get it because other than working at like a fast food restaurant or something, there was no jobs out there. And when I went in to apply for that job, I was up against fierce competition. I mean, I was going up against grown men who had, I mean, I'm in high school. Why would they give me a job when there's a, you know, these people with work experience trying to get the same job, right? But I got it, right? So I got the job and I saved up a long time, right? For almost a year. When we rented that apartment, <clears throat> it started taking money out of our out of our pocket, and within six months it was gone. Like we were cut to the very end. That was it. So when you say like you could have like bro, you could afford it on your first yeah, I could barely like anybody else who is working right now trying to make it with their apartments and their regular old job, they're not doing much different than what I was doing. Okay, so. I don't know how the times have changed from the Romans times to the 1995 to 2023. Like there's never been enough money from your employer to cover what it is that you need to have a happy life. It isn't going to happen. Like I, it's delusional to think that right now, I'm not saying that you can't go and get a job and then be conscious of what it is that you're getting from that job and to make sure that you don't go over and extend yourself 
I'm not saying that somebody couldn't be disciplined like that. Most people are not, right? Most people take their paycheck and it's gone within a few days. Now they're working for a week with no money trying to figure out how it is they can make it to the next paycheck. Yeah. So I tell all my younger friends, if everyone you work around are idiots, that means you're the one in the wrong place. They're right where they belong. You know, and that's and that's exactly right. Um, you know, you have to think. You're spending eight hours. Like, or generally, you're spending eight hours with these people. I remember I had worked with a guy who was, everything was negative. Like, he had nothing positive to say. Everything was down, you know, it was, he was just a down person. And, um, and it was hard. Like, at the end of the day, you know, I would feel drained because of his negative attitude that he would always have. Like, even if something positive would have, he would turn it around and make it a negative, you know. And so... Once that job was over and I wasn't around him anymore, I mean, it was like, all of a sudden, I just felt like this huge relief. I'm like, oh, God, man, what a what a horrible, like, month I had to spend doing siding with this guy, you know, or whatever. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really what it comes down to is, like, you know, the environment that you're in, I mean, that will eat at your subconscious. That will put it into you. You will become a negative person if you are surrounded by negative people or a negative environment, you know, like any kind of toxic relationship, you know, if you spend eight hours there, it's going to drain on you. So yeah, you know, surround yourself with the people that you want to be like, if where you're working at is not the way you want to be, well, you better get out of there because that's what you are. That's what you're going to end up being like. Hey, right on. Did I get a super check? Cool. Who sent me that? Let me go down there and find it. Oh, cool. I got a, uh, I got somebody to join in on the channel. Thank you very much. Uh, DS Kam, Kam, Kamikawa, <laughs> Kamikawa, thank you very much for joining the channel. Uh, for those of you um, who are just tuning in or you know new to the channel, I have started a membership to the channel where I will try and post a video once a week for you guys, just a members only video. And I'll give you early access to the videos that I post so that, you know, before the public, before they go live for the public to view, you can, you know, get an early view into those videos. I also plan on doing some other things to try and um, promote the membership, uh, maybe do some live streams or something like that, you know, just for members only to try and encourage, you know, more people to join the channel. Um, I really appreciate it. It helps support the channel. You know, the YouTube algorithm has really kind of messed with the ad revenue and it's not quite doing what it once had. So if I could have like the membership be what really sponsors the channel, what really carries the channel, then I would just be totally ecstatic with that. So I really appreciate anybody who's um, who's gonna who's gone and joined the channel. You know, the membership really appreciate that stuff. So thank you. Um, let's go down and find that super chat. That, there it is. Boom. Composite operator. Thank you so much. Hello, UE. What is your opinion uh, about lifestyle holding in plain sight, hiding in plain sight, living in the city as most people, but being self-sufficient, food, electricity, no need for luxuries from the city? Yeah, you know, that's kind of an interesting way of going about it. Like, I... Like, I've known a couple of people who, you know, were in, in between places to live. Like, they didn't have an apartment. They didn't really have a house to go to. And, you know, they would just, like, kind of kick it on people's couches or, you know, slept in their car or whatever. And, uh, you know, I was kind of watching them. They had a job, right? And, you know, they had facilities. Like, you know, they were showering at the, at the local pool. And, you know, had laundry facilities. And, um, it seemed to me like they were pretty happy with that. Like, they were stashing a lot of money. They were, you know, they had access to everything they really needed. I mean, they didn't have the convenience of being able to find a place to, like, you know, a, a, like a secure place to put all their stuff and to be there every day. But, but for the most part, it seemed like they did pretty well. So I guess in my opinion about that, if you're like a single individual and, you know, you resourceful, have, you know, a fairly decent network, that would be a really good way to go about it, especially if you had a decent, you know, paying job. I mean, think about how much money you could stash away if you didn't have any of the expenses of like having an apartment or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, 
Let's cruise down to the bottom here. Wow, so many comments. My goodness. All right. Uh, yeah, having the security is better. I agree. I think that think what caused me to take risk is owing the IRS a big bill and having to make a bunch of money quick. Yeah, and see, now that was actually... I, I experienced some of that last year. In fact, I'm kind of experiencing that a little bit again this year. Is that... um. I had like to try and get into the house. I it took every dime I had, including the money that I had set aside to pay taxes with, right? So it was just like I dumped everything into into the down payment of the house. Well, then I had to pay taxes on the money that I had earned and I didn't have a single dime saved up. So all of a sudden here I am trying to like earn all this money to to try and pay my taxes with and I spent like you know quite a few months trying to come up with that just to just to be just to break even again at the you know and then so this year i'm not in the same boat but kind of in the same boat again you know as far as like i wasn't able to save anything for the first you know three four months of the year as i was trying to like you know earn enough money to pay my taxes with so you know so then i think like you know i had to earn a, like and go for another three or four months to pay for the taxes this year so it was like i hardly made any money you know or it doesn't seem like i didn't like i shouldn't say that i mean i made it made money but you know, it all goes to taxes, right? He must be reading comments from the stream before we were able to join. Huh? Uh, let's see here. Thankfully, none, but I'm high into some leverage stocks. I guess these guys are talking. Leverage stocks, they have helped a lot, and I am thankful, but when you lose, it bites hard. Yeah. All right, let's see here. I guess you can't type and add an emoji. <laughs> Bummer. All right. There is fair. It's fair market value. Right. Um, right out of think, think, rich, grow rich by Napoleon Hill. What about the nobody showing up to save you? That part? I got a lot. I got a lot out of that book. I didn't read it completely. I did the audio book. I listened to it. I got probably most of the way through that book it was really good um i want to go back and actually read the book because even audio like i don't retain it quite the same like i can i'm good for about you know 10 15 20 minutes um you know when i'm reading or something like that the audio is a little bit better i can go for you know for an hour or so on that but i don't think i get the i don't think i retain it as well um, like some of the, some of the deeper information inside of it as I would as if when I'm reading or something, but anyway, it was a really excellent book and I'm glad I went, you know, and listened to as much as I did of it. Hey, thank you very much. Makeshift player for the, for the joining the channel. Very cool of you. All right. Uh, let's see here. Hey, -o from Sacramento, California. Hello, Mark. All right. What are my advantages of having an A16 credit score? I mean, I don't know. It can make life a little easier as far as applying for different things that, you know, they check your credit score for. But I mean, unless you plan on taking out debt, you know, then really it doesn't do much for you at all. Um, you know, I mean, there is some some cases in which they'll check your credit score for, you know, for some something that's not dealing with credit but for the most part unless you're taking out debt there's no real need for an 816 or an 800 credit score uh is it possible that the central banks buying gold in large amounts russia china will need that gold to assess usd on the open market i don't know i mean i think like really you have to think like Outside of the U.S. dollar, right, for a world reserve currency, what else is there? I mean, there's really nothing else. I mean, you got the euro, you got some of the other nations, yuan, you know, whatever. There's really nothing else out there that an individual can hold that's going to be a world reserve currency. Except for gold, right? Gold could do it. Gold once was the world reserve currency, and really, ultimately, it still is, if you think about it. And it can be easily. So... If a bank is really concerned and they're like, man, we don't know about our sovereign nation, we don't know about the dollars, we don't know about treasuries, we don't know about any of this stuff, certainly don't know about crypto, like, what else are you going to hold? You're going to hold gold, right? So gold is like the safest place that you could ever possibly go to. It's 
you know, no counterparty risk to it. The only thing about having gold, especially if you're like big bank kind of thing, is that you end up with a lot of gold. And if you have a lot of gold, then you have to store that gold. And the moment that you start storing it and securing it and protecting it, it's costing you money, right? So if you're storing gold and every minute of the day you're storing it, it's costing you money, is it really a benefit to you, right? So they're taking on the idea that they need some hedge against risk, but then also it's costing them to do that. So again, like, you know, are they doing it to try and get out of the dollar or to, you know, revalue the world reserve currency into something else? I mean, and then have like, you know, that transition, you know, to be on that base while it transitions into something else. Who knows what these banks are up to? But in my opinion, you know, when you look at the world reserve currency, the dollar in gold are really it. There's nobody, there's nothing else. I mean, you can take your gold to just about any nation and trade it for whatever you want, you know? All righty. Uh, the books are cook king, in my opinion, yeah. Um, what's the likelihood of a recession given the strong jobs data? Well, that's what really gets me about about something that Janet Yellen had said a while back. She said that she didn't feel like there would ever be another recession in our lifetime. And everybody thought that that was the funniest thing that she had ever said, you know, to like, you know, how could you possibly say this? It's like this country goes through a recession every seven to 12 years. I mean, it's been through like 13 depressions, right? So to say that there's never going to be another recession in our lifetime, I mean, how could you possibly say that? But then I think about it, like, what's the worst part of a recession? Right? Like, I mean, when it comes to a recession, every time there's ever one, what are the worst parts about it? People go unemployed, right? They don't have their jobs. And then the corporations get bailed out. And those are two things, and it, it pisses the taxpayers off something awful. So unemployment rising and bailing out corporations are the worst part of a recession, right? I mean, obviously, there's other things that are worse. But, you know, when it comes to, you know, the general idea of it, Losing your job and then having to bail out the corporations is what pisses everybody off. Well, we don't really have to worry about the jobs right now, do we? Like, you know, that's not like we have the best jobs market in 54 years, right? They just put 54,000 or 500,000 new jobs just got added last month or whatever it was. So the jobs aren't scared. Like, we're not scared about losing our jobs. I mean, even though, and this is something that I said too, is that, you're going to find these corporations, you know, they're, the Federal Reserve is trying to hack the heads off these zombie corporations. You're going to find a bunch of them laying off their employees, and then those employees are going to go find jobs at the lesser service employment jobs, right? They're going to go and find those lesser jobs, and that's exactly what's happening right now. I mean, look at all the articles that you find of all these tech companies laying off people, and then here's the best jobs report on January for January, right? The best jobs report in 54 years or whatever the damn thing said it, it like, right. So if you're going to have a recession, you're going to lose your job, but we're not losing our jobs because we got the best jobs report in 54 years. And we're not going to be bailing out corporations either because we already did that during the pandemic with the use of special purpose vehicles. Now I've talked about that one many times, but if you haven't heard about that, Back during the pandemic, when the country got locked down and the Federal Reserve, in conjunction with the Treasury, set up 13 lending facilities to try and backstop every corner of the financial market, one of those lending facilities was the corporate debt lending facility. And now the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, they can't really purchase these corporate bonds, not in the sense that like you think. So what they did is they set up a entity that was separated from the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. These are called special purpose vehicles. And this is what's going to be purchasing the corporate debt. They funded it with hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, put out the main, put out it on the mainstream media that they are going to be loading up on corporate debt, buying the fallen angels. You remember that? The fallen angels was going to be what they were purchasing. Everybody saw that one like, oh man, we got to buy up into this corporate debt before the Federal Reserve does so we can sell it to the Fed. We'll front run the Fed. 
boom. So they started jumping into the corporate debt. All these corporations started unloading or started loading up on this cheap debt. They were gorging on it, right? And everybody was talking about it too. They were like, man, the corporate debt market is just booming right now. Junk bonds, everybody's getting into it. It's because they thought the Federal Reserve was going to be buying these corporate debts. And so as the market was getting excited about that, they started buying into it. The prices started going up and that started driving even more people into it. So the corporations were able to load up on a lot of really cheap debt during that time. And the Federal Reserve hardly bought any. Like, they bought a little bit to establish a credible threat, put out that narrative, told the mainstream media to blast that all over the place. YouTubers were screaming their heads off about how the Federal Reserve was going to be picking the winners and losers. And they didn't hardly do anything. Like, the market bailed it out, right? So now the corporations are bailed out and people have plenty of jobs. I'm not saying Janet Yellen was right, but I mean... This was planned, right? I mean, if she said that they, she doesn't think there would be another recession in her lifetime, well, here's a condition in which that you don't have to worry about your job and the corporation's already built out. What recession, right? What recession? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a fan of Janet Yellen. I'm just saying that's kind of an interesting little story that took place. How many people we got in here? 237 of you. Awesome. Go hit that like button. We got 128 people who have hit the like button. If you go and hit that, it'll grab the video and spread it around for everybody to see. All right, there's, there doesn't have to be a replacement for the dollar because the system is the same. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think the system will change, though. I think the SWIFT system that they use now will be replaced. I mean, it'll be similar in a sense. I mean, I think they'll still maintain the control, and it'll be, for the most part, the way it was. But... I think it's going to be a different system um, based off of uh, central bank digital currencies and stuff like that. But yeah, who knows? Uh, A16 credit score creates a much lower insurance rate, homeowners and auto, but especially homeowners. Yeah, I mean, that's true. You do get other, you know, other benefits for having a high credit score like, like that, like having better insurance and stuff. But for the most part, again, it's just like, you know, whether or not you're going to be taking out debt. I love saying, whole oh, Lord Humongous. Thanks for being up in here, man. Uh, gold is heavy in the pocket. I suggest to wear a good belt so your britches don't sag. Yeah, you know, I always carry metals. Look, I got, I got a few ounces on me. I always carry silver with me. What am I carrying today? I got the same ones I think I had on, had with me the other day. Get them out of my pocket here. There we go. So yeah, the the maple leaf, right? Oops, get the shine. There we go. Got the Canadian maple leaf, which was given to me for Christmas present from Justin. Thank you very much, Justin, for that. And then I like this one. This is from um, the uh, what was it? Um, the Franklin Mint, and this is pretty cool. This is a thousand grains. It's the it's the only piece of silver that I I have that's actually measured in grains, and it's sterling silver. So it's not like pure silver. It's a uh, it's a pretty interesting little piece. But I like carrying that one around. It's a big thick bar. You see that? Pretty cool. Anyway, I carry silver with me everywhere I go. Um, I kind of I I started doing it kind of like almost like uh, in case I ran out of money, like I could like, you know, I have a piece of silver with me. Maybe I might be able to trade it for gas or something like that. So I kind of had it for like a case of emergencies, you know, survival, you know, trading barter thing. Um, but now I just carry it because I just like the, I just like having it with me. I don't know. It's just like, I like carrying silver with me and uh, I like showing it to people when people start talking about the monetary system or inflation or something like that. You drop a, you know, a little bit of silver in their hand and it's amazing. They all like, you know, they feel it and they look at it and they know what's real, you know, and the first thing they ask, how much is it worth? You know, it's, it's like, man, I wish people knew. I just wish, I don't wish that. I mean, it would be cool if people knew that, you know, you just walk up to anybody and it's just like, hey, what's spot price? And they'd be like, I don't know, what is it, 2280? You know, what it is. so that would be fun to have, have a society like that. Anytime I enjoyed a job, the pay was crap and the boss sucked. Always ruined it. <laughs> Uh, I haven't had a bank account for six years, been boycotting them for a long, for as long as possible, but got to open one again. Yeah, I mean, it makes it very difficult to, 
to try and conduct business without a bank account. Like I kind of did for a while. Like I had the bank account, but I, I rarely used it. Like I would carry all my cash. I, you know, paid bills with, you know, cashier's checks and stuff. Like, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't really use my account to pay bills with and stuff like that. But, um, it, it was just too inconvenient, you know, and I just finally gave up on it. All right. Janet Yellen is a old dirty witch. Lose your job, demand silver coin for labor. Yeah. Best time to look for a job when you already have one. That's for sure. Demand silver, have no job. <laughs> fallen angels are gold coins fallen in your pockets. Yeah, they are. All right. By that logic, the best time to find a wife is when you have one. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder how many people have tried that. You know, I think that's actually true for a lot of people. All right. Um, Jenna Yellenstein is fallen devil. <laughs> Uh, whatever happened to the SDR must be waiting to pounce in the shadows. Yeah, that's really kind of interesting about all this talk out there. You hear about the world reserve currencies and how, like, you know, the BRICS nations are taking over and stuff like that. But you, you don't find, I mean, they do pop up. And if you go look for them, you can find the articles. But not a lot of people talk about the special drawing rights. And if you're not familiar with special drawing rights, it's basically like a basket of world reserve currencies that, ultimately is like a world reserve currency it's really not meant for i mean i guess like the sdr is more for like countries to do transactions with and i don't think it's actually like like a like a currency you know i mean and not in the sense like we would think about it as as the federal reserve note or something but it is a basket of world currencies and the dollar being the dominant one inside of it. And it does get used for transactions along the, around the world, but hardly anybody ever really talks about it. Now, to me, like that would be the candidate for the world reserve currency would be the SDR, right? You know, if you took an SDR, say made a cryptocurrency out of that, that was backed by other cryptocurrencies or like other central bank digital currencies, you know, Fed coin, Yuan coin or whatever, and you put it all into the SDR, and have a single coin that way that's backed by all these other coins. You know, and then you can have like a world reserve currency that's basically built off of the nation's sovereign currencies. So, I mean, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. I'm just saying it could happen. Yeah. Any new info on the housing market? Sorry, I know it's a vague question, but all the buzz is crash. Correction is inbound. Ah, yeah. I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I still find the inventory is still too low, right? If we can get inventory up, if we can get some unemployment up, like, you know, having a best jobs market in 54 years doesn't really lend to the idea of people losing their job and not being able to make their payments. Like, if you have a job or have access to a job, even if it is painful, you'll still probably make your house payment. It's when you can't do it at all. It's when there's no jobs available and there's you know there's no prospect for one. That's when you'll stop making your payments. That's when it really comes to an end. So, I mean, yeah, there's some really tight situations coming up. I mean, that's for sure. We haven't really even felt what it's like to be in a restrictive economy. I mean, we're still kind of in neutral. We're exiting neutral, moving into restrictive, but we're not moving. We're not in like that full-on restrictive economy yet. We're headed there, and so I can't imagine what the next six months to a year is going to be like when the full impact of the Fed funds rate of five percent really starts to hit the economy. I mean, we're going to see what the housing market can really handle by then. However, with that being said, inventory rising. This is what's what's going to cause that. Like, what's going to cause this this inventory rise? You know, really new inventory comes from new construction and new construction right now is in the toilet, like tanked, right? So there's not gonna be a whole lot of new construction bringing inventory into the market. So we're looking for inventory coming from like foreclosures or people selling or panic selling or something like that. And with the elevated interest rates from the Fed funds, the interest rates on the mortgages, although have ticked up over the last you know few weeks, have not even exceeded what they had peaked out back in October, right? 
So the interest rates for mortgages aren't necessarily keeping pace with the lift, with the rising of Fed funds, right? So these two, or the, although are correlated, they're not like definitely correlated. I mean, there's obviously been a breakaway, you know, a few months ago, with the with the mortgage with the mortgages themselves not keeping up with the Fed funds. So these are these are some of the things that you know I look for. I mean, I want I I don't want to see it, but I want to see how it is that inventory is going to rise. If I could see that, like if I could be definite, it's going to be toxic mortgage backed securities that are doing it. It's going to be a m massive wave of you know unemployment. These are the type of things. Like there was this massive overbuild that's causing all this inventory. None of these things have taken place, not yet. When they if they do. We can change our story on it, but this seems to be the case right now. So long as that is the case, there is a huge pool of buyers out there that are itching. They want a house. I mean, you think about it. They don't want to buy an expensive house. They certainly don't want to buy one with high interest rates to it, but they want to live in a house. Like, they don't want to live in an apartment. They don't want to live with their parents. They don't want to live with their friends. They want to live in their own home. They have the money. They're just waiting for that good deal. And the moment that the good deal even remotely presents itself, boom, they get nabbed up right away. I mean, will that, you know, will that entire pool of inventory come down to meet the eager buyers? Like, can can those two meet at a lower price? Yeah, it's possible. But every time a house comes even remotely close to a good deal, bam, it's nabbed up, right? So this is the case that we're in right now. Um, anecdotal, okay. I uh, had a guy that, I'm, in fact, I'm going to try and get this guy on the show. He popped into the store. He was a salesman, a vendor for a company. And I get to talking to him. And I threw him a question. Like, he started talking about housing. And I'm like, okay, well, let's, know how, let's see how much you really know. And so I said something about like, I was just like, well, what do you think of the Federal Reserve and the unwinding of the balance sheet, unloading those mortgage-backed securities into the market? Do you think that's going to have an impact as far as the lifting or rising of interest rates and that being a burden on the uh, on the housing industry? And so I just kind of said something like that. Anybody who really follows would totally get it, right? Most people who hear that are just like, what the hell did he just say? He he picked up right away what I, what I said. And he goes, well, I think probably our bigger concern right now, and he's talking locally for himself, is the luxury apartment buildings that he had seen go up and only being half filled and now this is something that i i don't have an article or even like the individual to to give us this information but what he was saying is that these apartment complex that have recently been built are high luxury apartments these are like three four thousand dollar a month places and the buildings are only half full and they're having difficulty trying to fill them. Well, yeah, I mean, if you have high luxury apartments with the rents that high, why would you, you know, I mean, why would you go rent that? Right. I mean, you have to have pretty, you'd have to have a lot of confidence that you're going to be able to get paid a lot of money in order to rent one of these things. So what he is saying is that the fact that they have been built only get half residents filled that they are not going to be able to make their payments or meet the refinancing needs or whatever it is because they basically don't have the income coming into these projects due to the fact that the apartments are not filled, right? Did I say all that right? So in his mind, what he was saying is like, I, what he saw coming was that six months, whatever down the road, there's gonna come a moment where these things, these projects are gonna start going into bankruptcy because they won't be able to get the refinancing and they're not profitable. So. Once you start seeing buildings like that start going into bankruptcy and they get restructured, well, then now you can apply a rent to it that is more feasible to the conditions of the people around there. So how long out that goes, who knows? What that will do to the housing market, again, this is just a small local region, like local area that we were talking about. But if this is the same story that takes place throughout many nations or many places throughout the nation, well, then it could be like a similar story being told, you know, throughout, you know, much of the housing market. Again, I, I don't, I, I mean, it's just a possibility. It was just something that this guy was saying. And I thought, man, that's a pretty interesting theory, you know? So until we see it, you know, we don't know. All right. Hey, Simon. Hey, Lord. Is it pure silver? Uh, the silver or the maple leaf is the other one's uh, sterling silver. So 92 and a half. Um, all right, Johnny boy, are you? Okay. Uh, booze is going to be worth more than silver in a collapse. Those people are going to be going crazy. Um, 
Yeah, I, I would agree that during a downturn or recession, depressions, you know, economic collapse, whatever, you're probably going to find where booze is going to be a very popular item. People are going to want to get out of their out of their misery, you know, and they don't. I mean, you know, there's no faster way to forget about your problems than to start getting drunk. I mean, that's I know I did it. I did it for a long time and it works. Right. I mean, you will you will stop the spin on all your problems by getting drunk and man the problems that you get for doing that are five times worse and a hundred times worse than just dealing with the problems to begin with but unfortunately it just when you're in a depressive state or you're in a situation where you just don't feel like you can get out of it and you're depressed and your misery that's what ends up that's what a lot of people end up turning to and yeah i could see where booze is going to be a very popular item during a downturn a major downturn yeah i mean again i don't i don't drink or smoke and i try to encourage everybody else out there to not drink or smoke but i invest in marlboro cigarettes and anheuser busch i buy altria ticker symbol m o mo has a great dividend yield to it as well all right uh my carry piece is the Freedom Girl, Chris DeWayne coin. Yeah, I have a few of Chris DeWayne's coins too. Chris DeWayne, great, great. Um, what did he call those things? The uh, yeah, he was putting them out like once a week there for a while. They were killer. Yeah, I don't know. Is he still doing? All right, spot price on speed dial. <laughs> That's great. All right, I carry Mexican Libertards. No denomination on those. Yeah, I have a couple of those too. Those are pretty cool. I packed. They're some of my favorite ones. Those Mexican pieces are. Yeah. Um, I carry pieces of Springfield. <laughs> uh, I was terrible at savings before silver. Thanks for mentioning it, Yui. Hey, well, thank you very much. I know that's what did it for me. Like, I couldn't... I had a heck of a time trying to save any money. Like, I would save up a few hundred dollars, and it seemed the world would just take it from me, you know? Like, and it, it still feels that way. Like, you know, like, even just recently, I had, like, a medical bill that I thought I was going to get reimbursed for, and they are like, nope, you don't. I was like, of course, you, of course you're not, right? I mean, you... You earn the money, they take the money. It doesn't matter. It's like it doesn't matter how much you earn, they just take it from you. You know, it just feels it just feels that way. And so, um, you know, I would save like two hundred dollars, and then a bill would come up, and I would have to get rid of it. But I found that if I just go buy silver, I still have it. Like, you know, they can't take like you know they can ask for two hundred dollars, but they ain't got two hundred dollars. They don't take silver, so you know the silver I keep, and then you're gonna have to wait for the two hundred dollars, and you know. <laughs> And so I was able to actually start a savings doing that as well. And it was a actually a really easy way of, of saving because you couldn't just go and spend it, you know. Uh, as a Canadian, I always carry 1900 U.S. Morgan dollars. Show it to as many people. They are always interested. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I just carry silver all over the place. There you go. I got a silver Morgan too on me. It's this is like I think it was the last year they made them. What was it? Nineteen twenty one, yeah, nineteen twenty one silver Morgan right there. And I have some from uh, from the eighteen hundreds too. This particular one came from. Uh, I haven't seen them pop up on the on the chats for a while, but it, this particular piece came from uh, my my tinfoil hat. Stopped in at Bingo and gave this one to me, so I've been carrying it ever since. And then I have this one too. I'm, I've shown you guys. I might as well just show up all my silver pieces. I like this one. This is kind of like a little joke. It's called the Pluck Taxpayer. Right. One ounce of silver, and it's got this bald chicken running around on it. There's the back of it. But yeah, I like that one. That one's a lot of fun. I like showing people that one. <laughs> the Pluck Taxpayer. All right. Oh, right on. Did I get another super chat there? Sweet. Let's go find that thing. Man, there's so many comments. Okay. Hey, Jake. Uh, Jake Northwest. Thank you very much for the two dollars. Fed walking tightrope and future deflate or inflate. Fed walking tightrope is future deflate or inflate. Um. 
I, I think, well, I mean, right now, I think the Federal Reserve is pretty excited about having the Fed funds rate up to that 5%. Um, you know, I think with that, they are going to keep the interest rates elevated for a significant amount of time. Uh, it's going to be something that not a lot of people are prepared to deal with. You're starting to find more articles of people who are discussing it. But, you know, they're, they're thinking, excuse me, they have this feeling that the Federal Reserve is going to pivot, like pivot immediately. Like as soon as it gets down to that two percent, like, hey, we achieved our target. Cool. The Fed's gonna, the Fed's gonna start lowering the rates now, and I don't, I don't think that's gonna be the case. In fact, I think it's gonna be very difficult for the inflation to come down to the two percent over any kind of like short term. I think it's gonna take quite a while, like a significant amount of time to do that, and it's kind of. You kind of have to understand like the supply and demand issues that went with it. I've talked about this before, but like, you know, you had the supply and demand balance, right? But then we got hit with COVID and this huge, like, you know, lockdown and supply chain breakdown, right? So all of a sudden supply fell and we got stimulus, right? So we had this huge gap between the supply and demand. Now this imbalance is what's causing the prices to go up, right? Supply and demand. Well, now what the Federal Reserve is—they're trying to bring the supply in line with the de- with the, trying to bring the supply in line with the demand. But the problem with it is, is that they're working on the demand side of it, bringing that down. Problem is, is that the supply side is not coming back up, right? And if you damage the distributor, the manufacturer, the retailer out there, if you tell them, "Hey, we are hurting your customer," we are going to tell them we don't want them to participate in the economy. How likely are you to invest in distribution, retail, warehouses, bringing in all that supply to meet the demand, right? You're not going to do it. So the Federal Reserve is not only hurting the consumer by bringing them down, trying to meet, trying to bring them in line with the demand or with the supply, but the problem is, is that the supplier doesn't want to participate in it, so they're not coming up to to make that balance, right? So now what we end up having is, is we have the Federal Reserve who's working in this condition. And now they're both falling at the same time, right? The demand's coming down and so is the supply. Eventually it'll get to a point where the supply, well, where the demand will catch up with the lack of demand out there or the supply that reaches out with the demand. And these two will finally find their equilibrium and then take off from there. So I don't know if I explained all that like, accurately but that's kind of like the idea behind it is that there's going to be this transitioning that takes place as the fed is trying to get that demand in line with the supply of things out there it's going to drop under two percent or hit the two percent but it still won't be in line right and that's really where i think a lot of people are going to be missing it they're going to be like what the hell is the federal reserve doing they're causing unneeded damage or pain to the economy as they're trying to get this thing lined back up again Once the two balance out and we have the prices finally become stable, well, then they can start going into stimulating the economy again and stopping of interest rates and getting people out there to start borrowing money to go out there and spend into the economy again. I mean, at least that's the way I kind of see it going there. Thank you, Jake, for the question, and thank you for uh, for the super chat. It's very kind of you, man. All right, Paul C., thank you very much for the $10. It's very nice of you. If you can, can you explain what led the Mexican peso devaluation in 1994? I sort of think it was nefarious Mexico would agree to NAFTA. NAFTA, worst thing Mexican Mex, Mexico did to itself, in my opinion. Love your content. <laughs> um, gosh, I wish I could go. I should go back and read a little bit more on that. But from what I understand, didn't they in 1994, like, drop three zeros off of their currency to try and, like, you know, take, like, their 2,000 peso down to, like, two two pesos or something like that? Um, you know, the idea behind that is, is, like, you know, this inflation or inflating the money or whatever to revalue the currency onto a lower denomination or something like that. Um, as far as, like, the re... How did you put it? Um, the re or see devaluation. Um, I don't I don't know if that was done for NAFTA. I mean, this was that was happening like right about the time that I was graduating high school, and I could not tell you 
like anything that was really happening back in that time, like, you know, from my experiences of it. I do remember like traveling in Mexico and having the two different currencies and, you know, basically showing it to people. They're like, yeah, those are the same thing. One says two, one says 2000 or whatever. But as far as how that impacted with the NAFTA deal, I should probably do a little bit more research because that's probably a pretty, pretty good story that that happened right there with the uh, with the currency and stuff. So I'm sorry. Thank you for the ten dollars. But I don't think I can really answer the question properly. But now I'm going to go home and read about it. So there's that. <laughs> thank you. All right, Jake, thank you for the two dollars, man. So far, the market does not seem to agree with you. In what sense? Like. Um, in what sense, like, I, I mean, the Federal Reserve and the economy are not, the Federal Reserve, the economy, and the markets are not the same. Like, they're not the same thing. So, when I talk about the economy, I'm not talking about the Dow. Like, I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm talking about the money that you spend, the businesses that you start, how you save it what jobs you decide to take. That's the economy out there. Not not what the Dow Jones is doing. Like they can make that number do a lot of stuff, right? But that's not what the economy is. That's the markets. And um, so I'm, I, I'm not talking about the markets. Like whatever I'm talking about, if the markets agree with me or disagree, I don't really care. I'm not talking about the markets. Like that's, I mean, I could, you know, I might be able to throw a prediction out there that the market conditions or something like that, you know, might say that they might increase or decrease or something. But, um, yeah, it, what the Federal Reserve is focusing in on, I, I don't believe is going to be like what the price of a house is selling for. Like, I don't think that's their concern. I think it's the direction that that house is selling for, like if it's going up or down or what, what pace it's moving. Um, I think their major concern is uh, loans to make sure that the financial markets out there can provide a loan to anybody who wants one or not necessarily anybody who wants one. But if there's somebody out there who wants a loan for the house, that it's not a frozen market, that it's available out there, whether it's a good one or not. I think those are more of the Federal Reserve's concerns. So if the market disagrees with me, yeah, I don't that's I. I, I wouldn't be surprised with that at all. I mean, the markets usually get a lot of things wrong. So. All right. Wow, I, uh, it got dark. Just got out of the shower. Yeah, it is getting a little dark in here. I should have moved over there where that other light is. All right. Uh, Mexico is loaded with silver. Yeah. Wouldn't it be crazy if the central bank digital currency coming is called the Amero? <laughs> All right, the tequila crisis. Yeah, I remember that. The tequila crisis. They had a hard time getting tequila into the country. I remember because my wife really liked tequila too. All right, Harry discuss disgusted me with his frostbite story. No interest since. Interesting. All right. Oh, hey, Jake. Thanks for the two dollars. Maybe we weaponized dollar in '94 like we did now, like we do now. I, I don't know. Like, I mean, I remember it was a big deal with Clinton talking about that stuff. And uh, God, what was everybody saying? I was trying to remember some of the rhetoric that was being being blasted out there at the time, and I can't I can't really remember a lot of it. Uh. Uh, all right. Silver quarters are roughly six bucks. Interesting. All right. Cash ain't going nowhere soon. Don't be fooled. Of course, diversify. Still use cash. Just me. Yeah, and I don't. I don't see cash going anywhere soon. Like I. I mean, like a cashless society. I. I don't. I don't see it happening yet. Like, I mean, I mean, I could, but I mean, the, the fact that people like are so, so accustomed to it and then fear change that if you ever put out the word that they were pulling the cash out of the system, people would immediately start hoarding it. Like it would, it would immediately pull it out of the system. Like if they wanted it out of the system, just tell them they're going to take it out and immediately people would pull it out and start stuffing it under the mattress and stuff like that. But it isn't really going to matter if you do pull out all the cash because 
when they do decide that they're going to go into a cashless society using like a central bank digital currency in conjunction with cash, they'll just make it such a nuisance to use cash that people will simply just not want to do it. And they will just naturally move over to the central bank digital currency because it's going to be that much more convenient. So they're just going to charge you, charge you to deposit cash or charge you to withdraw cash. And if they're charging you to do it, it's going to be just a mu just as much as the negative interest rate that they are putting on your savings account. So most people are not going to hold savings. They're just going to be like, okay, well, if we have negative interest rate on our savings, give me my money, I'll pay my bills, and then I'm going to invest the rest or put it out somewhere where I feel like I won't lose it, like maybe in putting it into treasuries, treasury account or something like that and force people into treasury bonds. There's a lot of things that could happen, but when I see it taking place or if, if I was to see it taking place, it would come with cash being a nuisance. Like the stores are going to charge an extra fee if you use cash because they're going to get a charge to fee to deposit it, to, to deposit that cash into the bank. Anyway. Uh, da -da. Wow, Jake, thanks again, man. Uh, Mint, Mar Mint Market seems to think Fed will turn dovish. Yeah, and that's where that's where I think the market's got it wrong. Like, I mean, again, I don't, I don't necessarily, you know, think that the Fed. I mean, obviously, the Fed. If the Dow was crashing or something, the Fed is going to have to do something about it. But I don't really think the Fed is is too concerned about the markets. And I do believe that the markets have it wrong. I think the markets believe that the Federal Reserve is going to reverse course once the two percent inflation target has been hit. But that's not what the Federal Reserve is going to do. Like they've said it in their in their speeches, like they've said it in their in their own statements. I mean, we did videos talking about it, how they pretty much made that one mention that they were going to go for an average two percent inflation over time. They didn't tell us what an average inflation rate over time was defined as. We're going to have to just be basically, you know, at the whim of the Fed, you know, they're just basically, you know, arbitrarily just saying okay we're there you know we you know, we're we made the two percent you know average inflation rate over time but again there's no real like there's no real way of like judging like when that's going to be so the markets really can only go off of what they have experienced in the past and i think that they are can they are in a sense believing that the fed will turn dovish once the two percent inflation hits like i mean if that's what the Fed does, then I think the markets are accurate towards that. But I don't think that's what the Fed is going to do. All right. What is that? CH Ed, thanks for the $2. Very cool. All right. Celebrate the first super chat from Che Ed. What is it? Che Ed? Che Ed? I don't know. CH Ed, thank you very much, man. I appreciate that. All right. Haven't seen you around YouTube in a while. Uh, UE for Fed chairman. Gosh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Can I disband the Fed from the Fed chair position? I mean, he's just a speaker for the FOMC. You know, I think uh, I think that would be cool. You know, it was just like, let's go ahead and, you know, spit out this information that the FOMC is talking about. The only problem is, is that everybody would be blaming me for making the decision on it. And I'd be like, hey, I'm just talking for the FOMC. You know, I mean, I don't blame Jerome Powell, but lots of people do. So I don't know if I would necessarily want to be that scapegoat. <laughs> Hello, Simon. You have stated your belief Fed plans to hold rates high for longer than folks assume. What scenario, Black Swan event, do you think might accelerate Fed to pause and reverse? Um, well, that's just the thing about a black swan scenario. You can, you, you have no idea what it's going to be like or what that's, what that crisis situation is going to entail. Um, I think it's going to be a little bit more planned out than that. Um, I still foresee the food shortages coming. Um, I think that that's going to be a major issue when you have food shortages, you can pretty much push the people around to do whatever you, whatever, whatever you want them to. I mean, if they are hungry, they will beg for anything. They will, they will beg for food. So 
if the entire nation is going hungry or put into a you know a, a position in which that they are concerned about going hungry well then you can start making changes in fact if you put it in such a way that hey we got your solution right here on this central bank digital currency just accept it you know or get congress to go and vote it in and here's your central bank digital currency go out there and get some food so that's like kind of like more along the lines of what I think is going to happen is that it's going to be a position in which that the Federal Reserve has no other choice, right? Like, oh, hey, guys, you're all starving. We really don't know how else to handle this except for here. We'll issue out the central bank digital currency. And then it would be like, hey, it wasn't our fault. Like, you know, we just had to do it, you know, kind of like the pandemic. Um, so that would be like one of the like how I would see it go down. I mean, you could have like a major you know, weather event do it, war, another pandemic, you know, something like that, like something major that you just don't see coming or supposedly don't see coming, you know, that could that could do it. But I really think it's going to be more from like a food shortage situation. All right. Uh, 1964 earlier or silver, have you seen a man called Otto? I haven't. Uh, perception is reality. Don't worry about the world's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Just try to achieve your dreams. And that's absolutely the truth, the matter of it all. Like, you know, I don't, I don't base my decisions on what it is that I want for my life off of who happens to be in office. Like, that doesn't, other people, other politicians, laws, you know, things that are happening out there, they, that doesn't conduct my life. Like, I conduct my life. I make the decisions for it. And if an event takes place out there that is not necessarily conducive to what it is that I want to do with my life, well, then I'm going to figure out what it is that I do want to do. And because that particular situation is there doesn't mean that I am forced to, you know, behave in a way that says I'm accepting of it. I I don't have to accept it. I can move on with my life and do other things. So that's really what it comes down to is like understanding that, you know, decisions need to be made for yourself and to have your decisions being based off of somebody else's decisions out there leaves you in the external, right? It, it means that everything that's wrong with my life is on the external out there. And I, all these things need to be fixed in order for me to be happy. Right? And that's, that's really where a lot of people's major problems are is that they're focused in on the external. Like when do I get the better house, the better relationship, the better job, the better, you know, car or whatever. Once I get all these things lined up, I'll be happy. You get them all lined up. You realize, man, why am I still miserable? Right? It's because you're focused in on the outside. You're focused in on the external and not the internal. All right, cash will become collectibles. Yeah, cash already is kind of a collectibles. In fact, uh, one of the first uh, one of the first things that anybody had ever given me was uh, was an envelope that had a old silver certificate in it. And it was from a from a guy named John. A lot of you who have been following me on this channel for a long time might remember when John gave me that that first piece of. Uh, it was like, it wasn't necessarily like a piece of mail. It was a, like a letter. It was like a thank you, you know, that he had come into the store and handed to me. And, uh, man, it was, I was so touched by that. I'm like, man, I can't believe this guy went and, you know, took time out of his day and out of his collection because he gave me like this silver certificate. And, uh, and I was really taken back by that. And John pops up every once in a while and says hi. And yesterday he was like, hey, man, I'm in town right now from Portland. Let's go get a bite to eat, you know? And so John and I hung out um, for a couple of hours yesterday, just, you know, talking economics and and just bullshit about life and stuff. And it was a good time, man. So it was pretty cool to uh, to hang out with him and, you know, to have him from, you know, for such a long time fan, too. You know, so it was, it's pretty cool. Uh, doo -doo. Was there another one? Oh, right on. Esh Eshaton28, thank you very much for the $5. Appreciate your time. Remember, it's not red versus blue. It's the 1% versus you. And that's, I totally agree with that. I mean, I, I, I mean, I do honestly feel that there's, it's just a left-right paradigm. The Republicans and Democrats are very much on each other's side. You know, as far as, like, trying to get certain things to pass they will fight each other and pretend like you know it's a big giant war and that they disagree on it all but then in the end they 
pass it or it'll pass and then they all pat each other on the back saying hey good job i think obamacare was a was a perfect example of that like i've talked about that before you know there was all these you know when obama when the idea of having like a universal or national health care or something like that going on this obamacare i couldn't believe some of the some of the rhetoric coming out of like the, the republican party and what they were saying i mean it was just like they were talking about how it was going to create this total destruction of the entire economy and everybody was going to end up in the poorhouse and all kinds of stuff. I mean, they had like a lot of stuff that they were saying and, you know, I mean, right or wrong, whatever. Um, so it passes. Right. And now I, I'm loving it. Right. Because I hear how the Republicans wanted to repeal this Obamacare and replace it. And I'm like, wait a minute, you guys are just supposed to repeal not replace i mean you didn't like it before but now that you got it <laughs> you kind of like it don't you because you don't want to repeal it you want to replace it with something different your own little version of it because you couldn't really have one before right because that would have been you know not really agreeable with the con with the republican you know concept but once it's in place well now we can use it right so left right paradigm All right. Jake, thank you very much for the $5. Devil's advocate. Fed might be forced to pivot if they don't. We could enter a deflationary spiral and the system crashes. Markets can be smart too. Well, um okay, I I well I agree, but I think like once they start hitting to the deflationary spiral, I mean, I guess like if they get it to a point where they just couldn't stop it from happening and it just continued to spiral out of control where they just like literally just couldn't stop it from taking place no matter how much stimulus they did. I don't I I don't think that's going to be quite the case. Um, I think that if they if they kept if they couldn't take interest rates into negative territory and they were trying to maintain a low like interest rate low neutral interest rate world i think that could probably set off a just a deflationary spiral one that they can couldn't, couldn't stimulate with just simply because it, like how do you stimulate at, at the lower bound right i mean the way they did it this last time was with the pandemic so if you have an unusual and exigent circumstance right like unusual and exigent right gives them the ability to use powers that they normally wouldn't have so without that, then how do you stimulate the economy? I mean, they used up a pretty good amount of the credible threats, right? Just like basically jawboning people into going out there and borrowing money, you know, convincing them that they were going to, you know, maybe lower interest rates or do something that would stimulate the economy. And then people go out there and just start acting in that way. But how else do you do it? Like, that's really kind of where they're stuck at. It's like you're at the lower bound. You don't really have any way of like stimulating the economy by issuing out checks, you know, with like relief checks, pandemic checks. What ends up happening is, is that you have a low to negative return on capital investment. So as you put your investments out there, the return that you get off of it, it has not beaten the purchasing power or does not keep up with the with the inflation rate or the purchasing power. So you end up losing over time. Now, even though like this idea has inflation low, the return on capital investment is even lower, right? And so like if you invest your money, then the return that you get off of it doesn't actually benefit you going into the future. If you have higher interest rates, it takes time, but that capital investment will eventually have a return. And then that return on capital investment can then start spinning into the economy, right? So it takes time down the road for that to take place. I mean, again, if we start running into times where the economy is slowing down dramatically, prices come down and then start going into a deflationary situation in which that the Federal Reserve is trying to stimulate, what are they going to do? Like, what what tools will they have? I mean, what situation will the economy be in? What kind of pandemic situations? Who knows what any of that stuff is? But I feel that if they were at a situation in which that they needed to stimulate the economy and they're at the lower bound of zero and they don't really have a pandemic or anything else going on, just the, you know, the slowdown in economic activity alone might, you know, get the people to say, hey, you know, we're not feeling it here. We're feeling pretty painful. What is it that we need to do? 
And how is it that you convince the people to switch the monetary policy over into a central bank digital currency and then take ne interest rates negative? I don't know how you like just willingly get the people to say, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. Let's do that since things are so slow right now. It's going to take like a crisis. It's going to take a panic of some sort. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you how that's all going to go down. But, you know, as far as the Federal Reserve, like I, I, I really honestly, I think that they have they got control over the situation. They know exactly what they are doing and they put put us right here, right where they want them right where they want us. I mean, they wanted it, you know, an well anchored inflation expectation. They got it. You know, they wanted the neutral interest rate to be higher than it is, you know, than it was back in 2018. They got it. You know, um, they were looking for that average inflation rate over time. They said that they're going to do it. You know, eventually they're going to go for central bank digital currencies. We'll see how it comes. Yeah. All right. Hey, Brian, thank you very much for the $5. Going to Carnival in Trinidad to party with for a week. Using the booze pill to quit when I get back. It works. Tequila is my liquor, too. I prefer... Float Fortaleza? Fortaleza? Fort Fortaleza? I don't know what that is. The alcohol pill. Oh, uh, Anabuse? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I knew I never took Anabuse myself. I didn't have to, but I know a few people who did. And man, if you're not familiar with Anabuse, it's just a pill that you take. And if you consume any kind of alcohol, it makes you sicker than a dog. So. Yeah, it kind of keeps people from getting drunk. But although I knew people who would take that abuse and still go and get drunk, they would they would fight through it. You know, they would fight through getting sick or whatever and still get. Oh, God, I can't imagine. All right. Uh, off topic. How many cups of coffee do you drink in a day? That's a really good question. I drink a lot of coffee. Let's see here. So in the morning, I usually get up and I try not to drink coffee right away. I usually try and be awake for at least a half an hour or so before like because i used to get up and immediately as soon as i wake up start drinking coffee but now i get up and i try to drink a couple of glasses of water before i start drinking coffee um i get up early really really early like i'm up at you know four o'clock in the morning so about four thirty, five o'clock i'll start drinking coffee and i will have maybe anywhere from four to five cups before i leave for work and then uh when i get to work usually uh you know if we have coffee like not always do we have coffee at work because we you know buy the coffee ourselves and there's only a couple of us who actually drink the coffee and i drink the majority of it so i have to buy the coffee and i don't always buy the coffee right so i don't have to buy it but i usually try to buy the coffee because i drink the most of it so we haven't had coffee at work lately uh, over the last few like maybe the last week but when we do i don't know i'll probably drink another you know four or five cups throughout the day and I try to stop drinking coffee around three o'clock in the afternoon, unless I'm doing something like a live stream or something like that. And then I'll, I'll drink another cup of coffee. So way too much, way, way, way too much coffee. Um, pretty much has me in a constant caffeine based consciousness. Um, and there is times that I have given up coffee for a while and it was kind of crazy. Um, I had given it up for like, I don't know, it was probably two or three weeks into into not having any coffee at all. And it was crazy because I had two different people tell me that I gave the worst customer service at the store that they had ever had. And that is something that really hit me hard because I'm usually the person that everybody is asking if I manage the store or I own the place. And to have somebody say that I gave them the worst customer service they had ever had, I was just like, man, I have turned into a grumpy dude, you know, like I need my caffeine back or something because I'm just not the same person anymore. And so anyway, I went back to drinking coffee and never got that complaint against me again. <laughs> All right. What was it? The young are realizing who is going to pay the bills for the pensions. What country would you like, would you live in other than the U.S.? What country? 
I don't know. I like the U.S., but if I wasn't going to live here, I mean, I guess I would want to live someplace that was, like, tropical. Like, you know, I mean, if you're asking me, like, for the economic conditions of it, I I just want to live in the U.S. then because I don't feel that any other nation is going to do that much better than what the U.S. is going to be doing here over the next few years. Um, you know, I mean, I guess if there was, like, you know... A choice, I mean, isn't like Liechtenstein like the most libertarian nation out there? So maybe, maybe go there. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Is anything guaranteed except for death and taxes? You know? Banks are never your friend. You know? Are they going to GG with the taxes? People are feeling the it's dumb to work because they are taxed to the max and they are not earning their value. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I hear a lot about like when I was really broke, not earning a lot of money, had two kids. I loved filing taxes. In fact, that, you know, earned income credit with the two kids, the child tax credits and the earned income and all that other stuff. I mean, like, tax filing taxes was like payday like i actually earned money for filing taxes like i didn't pay any taxes and i got some money back right because that's how poor i was when i was working so yeah filing taxes when you're poor is like awesome it's actually like payday you know all right living in parents basements are and not working people live they refuse to work and live with mommy. Yeah, that's what I hear a lot. In fact, I see it more and more too. Um, in fact, I had a I ran into a a couple of people yesterday, and at first I didn't quite get what was happening here. I thought it was I thought it was like this guy working for this lady, and it turned out it was like this lady's son. And I'm listening to them communicate with each other and i'm thinking holy moly bro like you have no independence man like you seem like a big guy you know you look like you're you know like normal ish you know but like i could see like he could not function on his own like he he couldn't do it, it, it you know he had no like i don't think he had any kind of real concept of being like independent or on his own or anything and i and i was just like i was a little bit taken back by it i'm like man is this really happening here you know <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking I was on my own since I was 18 years old. It sucked. I didn't have any idea what the hell I was doing. And you know, it took a long time to, like, took me until I was 40 to figure it out. But, you know, uh, some people are just like, they're never, like, they don't even have, like, a chance. You know, like, I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, man, he'll, I don't think he'll ever have an apartment or anything on his own or anything. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of scary to think, like, how many people are out there like that, you know? Uh, no one questioned 1971 when coming off the gold standard. Oh, I think they did. I think, I think a lot of people did. I don't think like the average person gave a, cared, but I think there was plenty of people who were like pointing the finger going, oh, no, 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 this is a bad deal right here. Um, but as far as any kind of like protest against it, yeah, you're right there. I don't think anybody cared that, that much, you know? All right. People always want their packages on their doorstep food and housing and cars and computer and phone yeah i made money i made a money cake with the cash and it was barely enough my brother added a hundred dollars for the topper young men under 30 today are not motivated like previous generations yeah they're really not and I, i'm not exactly sure why you know like i mean what is it that that it has this lack of motivation within them i mean i know for me like i wanted to earn money because i didn't wanted a car like i i mean i had this crappy little car that my dad had given me but i didn't i needed to come up with insurance and gas all the stuff to have this car so having a job for me meant that i had like we like freedom like i was you know i had wheels to get around and you know being out in the country you know you got only a handful of friends that you're going to actually you know, walk the mile to their house or whatever. So having a car meant that all of a sudden now you can go and visit and hang out with people and stuff. So like to me, 
I, I couldn't wait to have that. Like, I was looking for work. I was looking for a job. I was looking to get the, my driver's license and insurance and get out there and get, you know, do those things. Like, I was motivated to make that stuff happen because I was just tired of sitting at home, you know? Um, but I guess I didn't have video games either, you know? And to me, like, entertainment was fishing poles and shotguns and stuff like that. Like, that was entertainment for me, not not playing on video games. So... I guess like with the kids nowadays, if you're sitting around just playing on devices or video games, that's where the fun is. That's where you're at. Yeah, there's no motivation to leave. Like you can just connect with your friends right there on the screen. So, I mean, yeah, I guess it kind of makes sense why, you know, the, the lack of motivation, you know, but I don't know. And it's also like, I was, I was also like motivated because I wanted to go hang out with girls too, like. I don't, I don't see like, you know, a lot of guys, they, you know, I see them out there, like I see them at the bar or I, and they don't seem very like, I don't know, like, you know, out there trying to, you know, meet women or do anything like that. They, they, I don't know, like kind of lost that idea or something. I, I don't, I don't get it. Like, I mean, at 30 years old, like I cannot imagine my life being wrapped around video games. You know, and I understand that like video games are a big deal nowadays, you know, especially for even adults because, you know, we grew up with them and something like that. And I don't even literally have like anything bad to say about video games because you can earn money playing video games nowadays. So there's actually a job that could be made there. But I think about like, where does the creativity, you know, where's where, how do you get creative? How do you get a mad like your imagination, your, you know, your thoughts of like, you know, starting businesses and doing things like that, like. You, you lose all that when you're sitting there playing your video game. You're just concentrated on that, you know, getting your dopamine hits and shit like, you know, from whatever, from getting the higher scores or however it goes down. So, I mean, I can see where you're motivated to try and and get, you know, get the get excited for, for like playing video games, you know, you get in the flow state, you get the dopamine off of it. It's kind of like a fun thing to be in and you could spend hours doing that. So I could see where like, you know, somebody might lose their motivation to try and like build a career or something like that when their motivation is to, to be in that flow state and getting the dopamine hits. And that's, what's really exciting. them, not, not anything else, you know? So I don't know. Da, da, da. Next man, so many questions up in here. It's awesome. So many comments. Believe it or not, America has some of the lowest two parent household rates in the world. Yeah, I totally believe that. I mean, I mean, it seems like everybody I know, their parents divorced. Very few people that I know have like have parents that were there the entire time, stayed together the entire time. Or like weren't married before, you know, before they, before they, you know, met, and had the kids or whatever. I mean, my wife and I, we've been together since we were 18. So, you know, there's a couple people like I, my, I have some, a friend, uh, who hooked up with his lady about the same time. They're still together. Um, I don't want to drop their names just because they're probably watching. Um, the guy I work with, he's been with his girl for about 15 years now and stuff. So there are a few guys who, you know, who kind of stick it out there or a few couples who, you know, stick it out there. But, yeah, there's so many other people that I know who broke up. Like, everybody else breaks up. Just a handful of people didn't, really. Yeah. Uh, I love my career. You know, I'm starting to love my career. I'm loving this YouTube thing. I mean, this is the career that I would really like to have, you know, doing economic videos doing speaking engagements and stuff like that man talk about a career that would be the career to have you know all right thank god it didn't happen on the bus five minutes later and i would have never want to show my face downtown again wow what were you guys talking about <laughs> all right uh it's going to get worse when vr become advanced all right uh, video games used to, used to good. If you see a younger player online all the time, they probably enjoy anime. Yeah. 
you can't get back wasted time. That is so true. And, you know, I think that's probably where I ended up, like, putting down the video games is I remember I was, I don't know, it was like I don't know, one of the one of the racing games. I don't know what it was. Diddy Kong Racing or something. You know? So I remember like it had kept track of how many hours I had played and it was like days. Like I had literally put like like, you know, you keeps track of how many hours you play. And it was like days that I had been there playing this damn game. And I thought, holy moly, I wasted that much time literally sitting here that days had been wasted playing this game. And I thought, nah, I can't do that no more. You know, and that's, I, it was right about that time I kind of gave up video games. You know? I didn't really give them up. I just stopped playing as much. Simon, I was reading a book book and it said for an economy to grow we have to print money responsibly with a finite resource like gold how would the economy grow thoughts okay so i think that's probably off of the idea that there is not enough currency in the system in order to provide to provide the or facilitate the commerce right that's that's kind of the idea behind the gold standards that there's just simply not enough gold to to facilitate the trades and that's true um except that it's not because what you end up with is a is a boom and bust cycle right so the idea that what is it um in order for our economy to grow we need to print money no in order for the economy to grow you need to be able to do transactions right and the more transactions you can do the more business that can be done so it's not necessarily like you need to print money to make the economy grow. It's just that in order for the economy to grow, you need to be able to facilitate the trade. And that's where the printing of money makes facilitates the trade. Now, that's what the Federal Reserve was sold as, right? So like by that argument yourself that you're from the book that you're reading, the Federal Reserve was sold to Congress and the government or whatever as the ability to expand the money supply when the economy was heating up and then contract the money supply when the economy slowed down. So actually smoothing out the business cycle. That's like the whole idea behind it all. So as the economy started to ramp up and things started happening and then the money started flowing, the concentration would start to flow into the handfuls of people. Right? And then, you know, a handful of people who are conducting the most business or whatever, you get this concentration of wealth. Well, this is the business cycle. So as you get in this concentration of wealth, there's less money out there to facilitate the trade for commerce, right? Then pretty soon business slows down and then boom, you have this redistribution of wealth as the money starts leaving the leaving the hands of the people who had concentrated it. Then the whole system starts over again. So you have these boom and bust cycles, these boom and bust business cycles. Well, the Federal Reserve was going to smooth that out, right? Well, eventually what ended up happening is, is that they got into a point where they were no longer smoothing out the booms and busts of the business cycle, but actually creating booms and busts within the debt cycle, right? So now we're in a situation in which that when the economy slows down, instead of contracting the money supply so that there would be, a, you know, a, the appropriate amount of currency within the system, as the economy slows down, they're trying to stimulate the economy by dumping a bunch of money into it. So they have actually flipped around exactly what it was that they were trying to do. Like, you know, provide an elastic money supply. Now they're trying to stimulate the stimulate the economy with it. So depending on how old your book is and how it is that they are planning on using the Federal Reserve to conduct the commerce within the business, could say like, hey, back in the day, they were trying to expand the money supply during, you know, hot economy. And nowadays they try to expand the money supply to create a hot economy. You know, it's much different. All right. I saved the data to my phone because it was from a reliable source. I'm trying to find it so I can post the source. All right. Uh, I was 15, still one long day. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's crazy, but it's so true how younger people are so lazy. I'm 35 and I don't feel like I work that hard, but with AI soon coming to take all our jobs, you better really start grinding. Um, no, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe AI is going to take your jobs away. All right. I mean, I've used the analogy before, not the analogy, but use the story of like 
telephone operators, right? There used to be like warehouses of women sitting in front of switchboards, pulling like wires and plugs and just moving the stuff, you know, conducting the, the, you know, the operations of the phone lines. And when they, when they moved from pulling plugs and doing that to, you know, basically doing digital switchboards, they didn't need all these, all these people, all these women doing this. And they said, oh man, all these women are going to become unemployed. They're not going to have anything to do. It's going to be this, you know, it's going to be really, you know, catastrophic for them and stuff like that. But that wasn't the case, right? What ended up happening is, is that it freed them up to go and pursue what it is that they truly wanted to do with their life. Like, nobody wants to sit in front of a switchboard and do that all day. Like, that isn't fulfilling, right? But going to school, getting an education, becoming a doctor, lawyer, you know, a politician, going and doing things with your life that you truly wanted to do. Maybe, you know, I don't know, whatever it was. Like, you know, this this idea that women were not going to have anything to do was completely wrong, Right? The women who lost the ability to have this job as an as a telephone operator found the ability to go to school, to go and pursue the things that they really wanted to do with their life, to go and advance themselves. That's what really ended up happening from it. So I think about like today when when like just like this, you know, like the comment, like, you know, we're going to lose our jobs because of AI. No, what you're going to end up doing is losing your job to a robot, but then it's going to free you up to go and pursue what it is you truly wanted to do with your life, right? It'll free that up. And I don't, I, I know it's kind of like, you know, it's hard to, oh yeah, it's easy to say that, but when I lose my job, what am I supposed to do? Just imagine that I'm going to have this better life. That's not the way it goes down. What I'm trying to say is, is like these AIs are going to bring more conveniences to our lives. And with more convenience to our lives, that frees us up to not have to work to provide ourselves with that convenience. You, you see where I'm kind of getting at? It's like people don't need a car anymore because it's so convenient to ride around. You can Uber or Lyft or whatever. You don't need a car anymore because the convenience of having a car is just pretty much provided for you. And that's the type of thing that's going to continue on as the AI advances is that all these conveniences are going to become cheaper and easier to conduct our lives through. We won't have to work as hard to try and provide ourselves with those conveniences and you can already see it taking place i mean just the fact that you know so many lazy young people right now it's because they have access to so much conveniences if i didn't i mean when i was a kid i didn't have the convenience of being able to go and hang out with my friends i had to walk there i had to go and work in order to get the convenience to to go and visit my friends but now if you can visit your friends by just turning on the screen and saying hey what's happening dude like, you don't have to go anywhere. You can connect with them right there through the screen. Although it's not a real connection, it's still, like, you know, good enough for a lot of people. All right. Man, so many comments. Thank you so much, A. Ron Hover, for the $2. AI takes my job and I pursue my dreams. UBI. Well, yeah, I mean, why not? Just, you know, I mean, if they're going to provide us with UBI... Set yourself up, man. I mean, you know, most people will take the UBI and say, hey, I'm just going to live my life with you. You can take the UBI and invest that and go and work and do all kinds of stuff and just make a, make a killing out of it. I mean, but I would imagine that most people, if they get a UBI check, they are not going to work. Like, they are, they'll be like, nope, no thank you. Give me my weed. Give me my music. I'll be at the beach. See you all later, you know. <laughs> All right, technology enabling the grocery stores to pass on the work to us and bag our own groceries and self-checkout. Yeah, you know, um, you're eating bug puree. You won't need teeth. <laughs> oh. At what point will convenience start being a nuisance? Um, when convenience becomes a nuisance, I don't know. I mean, does it ever become a nuisance? When, when does convenience become a nuisance when you don't get the convenience anymore? That's when it becomes a nuisance, right? When they, when they turn the convenience off, when you're like, oh, how am I supposed to get around? You know, and they're like, well, you got to go and get a job and buy a car, pay insurance, and gas. And like, oh, it's too hard. I can't do that. Never mind. I'll just stay here. <laughs> All right. Um, doo -doo. You know, 
I ain't eating bugs. Everybody says you're going to eat the bugs. I don't. I ain't eating no bugs. I mean, I might. I, I, I might eat a bug, but I'm going to do it by my choice. It's probably going to be dipped in chocolate, but I'm not eating bugs. I mean, all these people say you're going to eat bugs. There is a million ways to feed yourself. I mean, do they eat bugs back in the, you know, back in the day before they had grocery stores and commercial farming and stuff? No, they grew food, man. You know? Although I guess imagine like the people in the city might have to eat bugs because they won't have any place to grow food. So there's that, I guess. Um, like the convenience of having someone bag your groceries. You know? uh, we're not in our bodies. They are just rentals and nothing is truly owned by any human. We all die. Can't take it with only pass on to your family. Uh, let's see here. As the same amount of dollars are available to chase new goods, services, value, as was available before. It's when the system of responsible money supply management corrupted that we see our current predicament. Yeah. All right. 15 minute cities coming. We can grow our own vegetables, yeah. Let the chickens eat the bugs. I'll eat the chickens. There you go. That's exactly right. Let the bu let the chickens eat the bugs, and I'll eat the chickens. I once found a bug in my nug. Oh yeah, spider mites, huh? All right. Uh, people seem to be a lot happier with less conveniences. Um, I think people are are more content can be more content without the conveniences and i and i think and i think like when i and my experience with that was when i was on the little hobby farm before i moved into town and living in you know living in that little farmhouse and on that hobby farm um we didn't have a whole lot like we didn't you know we had like we just didn't have a whole lot we were really poor really broke and um uh, but we had like you know the hobby farm going we had the animals we had you know we had things to do there. And so like that kind of kept us occupied, kept us entertained, you know, dealing with the dealing with the animals and dealing, tending the garden and just, you know, being there on the farm and just doing that kind of thing. Um, like we didn't have a whole lot going on, but we didn't really tr we didn't have to like really try hard for like food. I mean, we have like plenty of food, so that was nice. And then like you know, it was convenient because it was just like right there, you know, we didn't really have to go anywhere for it. And, you know, as far as like pleasures of life, you know, we found that just being there was, was pleasure. Like we enjoyed our, you know, each other's company. We enjoyed like, you know, just hanging out there and we didn't have much. So we were kind of just focused in on each other. And so like Cantillon explains wealth as food, conveniences and pleasures of life. I had all that on that farm. Like I had all that stuff. And I hardly had any money at all and hardly had any way of making any money. But yet food conveniences and pleasures of life were were like abundant there, you know. So that's wealth. And no matter how you look at it, like, you know, 1700 year old essay says that. So that's really where I think a lot of people kind of get confused by. It. And so conveniences can be irritating or become less convenient even as you have to condition your life in order to acquire those conveniences, right? You have to show up every day for the job. You have to make sure you pay the bills. You have to do all these things in order to have all these conveniences. But yet, if you were content with just a handful of things, the conveniences might be there. You might find that it really doesn't take a whole lot to have a lot of wealth, you know? And I realized that when I was on that little hobby farm. All right. Okay, we can have the conveniences, but where does the money come from? And don't you think resources are finite? Um, yeah, no. I mean, some like natural resources like, you know, mines and oil and stuff like that, that's that's finite. There's only a certain amount of it out there, but you can you can increase like the population of of your animals like you know the amount of you know herd of animals that you have you can concentrate them into a small piece of land and then feed them from another piece of land like you can grow hay on another spot and then feed them in a concentrated area so 
I, in my opinion, like, I don't think the growing of animals or food are finite. Like, I think that's an unlimited amount that you can go. Well, I mean, there is a limit to it. I mean, you can only grow so much, but you know, for the most part, it's in my opinion, I don't think it's that finite. Like, I think we have a long ways to go before we would come to a limit on how much we can produce when it comes to, to farms and or when it comes to animals and vegetables and stuff. Now, on a commercial scale, that might be a little different, but as an individual, I think you can grow and raise far more than you can consume. Like you can produce an incredible amount of, of abundance, you know, enough abundance to, you know, for 10 people, you know, an individual can grow a lot of food. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Moving on. Uh, nice. Does anybody whistle anymore? Like, like whistle? <laughs> uh, we need less conveniences and more community. Yeah. I've been seeing a lot of affordable issues out there. I think people are hurting. Affordability issues? Oh, affordability issues, yeah. Every, ever try to get a smart home device to function ideally? The convenience is gone. It all takes longer and does a worse job. Uh, just add some beef fat and that soy filler burger tastes great. <laughs> UE and chat, do you think more people will downsize to small homes like mini homes and mobile homes or apartments or both really want to venture in one of these industries? Yeah, I think that's going to I think that's going to be a big Okay. Um I think it's going to be a big trend um going into the future is is the small homes, small uh, like not the McMansions, you know, big homes. That's for raising families. Like that's what, you know, people, but the raising of families isn't really that popular anymore. I mean, we were finding like, you know, less, you know, more divorces, you know, with households and children and stuff like that taking place now than ever. And, um, and I just don't see where like having a big house is going to be a needed thing. Like, you know, I just don't, I don't see why they would want that. So convenience of having a small apartment or even like the convenience of having a van to live in, like I, if I was an individual without a family or anything else, I would totally live in a van. Like why, like there's so many things, like my buddy who was like, you know, using the shower down at the pool and hanging out with his, you know, friends or whatever, using the laundry mat for his stuff. Like what's the point of having a house? I mean, if, unless you like, I mean, unless you wanted to farm it or, you know, use it to, to try and build some wealth with, you know, like having a house to rent out or something. But just as being an individual person, I don't know what the point of that would be. Like van life would totally work for an individual. And I could see that being very popular going into the future. Uh, wow, look at all these comments. My gosh. All right. Um, we're going to be using fossil fuels for the next 20 years. This net zero is total overreaction. I've been seeing people buy pigs to share among a group to save on meat. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's not uncommon to split a beef. Like you know you like you go in with the neighbor and you buy you know you buy a cow together or buy a a steer or whatever and you and you split the meat. Um, you know when I was when I was raising the birds when I was raising the chickens I would order uh, fifty. 50 chicks at a time and sell half of them sell you know half the birds to help pay for the chicks right um so that was one way i was able to actually acquire birds for myself is that i'd order 50 and then sell half the birds for you know twice what i paid for them which it was convenient for the people because they didn't have to go get the birds i actually brought the birds to them and i'm like hey here's your birds give me my money you know and um and it worked out really well so i could pay for my birds that way then once you raised the birds and butchered them and sold them, that would pay for the feed, right? So you pay for the feed for the next batch. Pretty soon you're working on none of your own money. Like, you know, the first batch you put in, you paid for, but then it paid for itself. And then after that, it's just, you know, it's just generating its own money. Um, a lot of work goes into it, but yeah, that's what I did for quite a few years. It was, it was fun raising those birds. Yeah. Gross. God, chickens are so nasty little creatures. 
Um, it's just when it rains and it gets really nasty and muddy and it's just, oh God, it's just horrible. Okay. Question. Prior, 1971, the U.S. dollar was the reserve currency. Uh, and U.S. did not have to provide dollars to the whole world. Is that right? Prior to 1971, the U.S. was the world reserve currency, and the U.S. did not have to provide the dollars to the world. Is that right? Um, no, I think I don't think that's that's. I mean, so the dollar was the world reserve currency at the time, but it was still gold, right? I mean, gold was like the world reserve currency. It was the gold standard. I mean, and so. Although, like, the dollar was used as the world reserve currency, gold in itself was the actual reserve currency. The dollar was just a representative of the gold that was being used because it was an easier transaction. So, I guess, like, the idea, what was the question again on that? Um, prior to 1971, the U.S. dollar was a world reserve currency and the U.S. didn't have to provide the dollars, but they did have to provide the dollars for the world. I mean, there was currency exchanges and different things like that. Um, I think what the major problem with that was is that the dollars that were printed up and pushed out there into the system, I think people caught on to that, that there was more dollars than there was gold. And so it was the fact that they had to push it out there to the people, right? To, to use it as the world reserve currency. And the fact that they had lost trust meant that nobody wanted to get their currency. Like, you know, no currency exchanges, no anything. Like, they were like, get rid of these damn dollars, you know, get them out of my pocket. And so that's really where I think the, um, the administration really started having issues. Is like trying to figure out how it is that they were going to transfer from a gold standard onto this dollar standard. And then have the dollar be the world reserve currency. Because nobody really wanted to trust the dollar. Right? And it was like, well, if you're not going to back it with gold, then why even have it here? And so that's really where, like, the Carter administration had to, like, kind of fix this issue. It's just like, nobody wants these dollars. We're running into this inflationary scenario. All these dollars are coming home. See, that's the difference between, like, 1970 inflation and the inflation that we experienced recently. Is that back in 1970s, you know, in the 70s, they, the world really did hate the dollar. Like, they did not want it. They tried to create that situation with sanctions and all kinds of stuff, but you can see there's still a huge demand for the dollar around the world as the contracts are due, you know, are due in dollars. So, back in 19, back in the 70s, like, the world hated the dollar. Like, screw you, we're done with you, right? You, you know, printed up too much of it, and you're not backed by gold anymore. So Carter was just like, okay, what do we do, man? We can't, like, we got to get some, we got to get the people out there demanding dollars again, or at least, you know, have confidence in the dollar. How do we, you know, sell these treasuries off? And that's when they started issuing out treasuries in, in a foreign nation's currency. They started issuing out, these are U.S. treasuries that were issued out in German marks and Swiss francs, right? And so when these things came due, they were coming due, not in U.S. dollars, but coming due in German marks. And people were like, okay, well, if you're going to pay us in marks, then yeah, I guess we can go ahead and buy your treasuries now. And so Carter was able to actually you know, get some, get some funding into the treasuries by, by issuing out those treasuries in, in, in a foreign nation. And then when Volcker came in and raised the interest rates up to 15%, that's when everybody was just like, okay, cool, return on capital investment. And then they started pouring into the U.S. treasuries at that point. So that's really how it went down. I mean, it, they still have to get the currency out there, but I think the way that the currency was going out was much different from the way it is today. Like currency swaps and stuff like that isn't going to cut it. Like in order to get the enough currency out to the rest of the world to get the dollars out there, you just got to simply just buy their stuff, you know, either that or buy their debt. You know, you could go and buy their debt and give them dollars and then take their, take their, you know, their bonds or something like that. And you could issue out debt that way. But, you know, the, the United States isn't in a position in which that they can lend money out. So I don't think that would happen. They have to buy stuff. <laughs> I don't know. Did I ramble on about, enough about that? I, I don't know. I want to go... Oops. Sorry, guys. Where'd you go? Here we go. All right. I want to 
go van life. I'm tired of working crappy jobs and being taxed near 50%. Yeah. Eating government cheese down by the river. Yeah, that's what'll end up happening if you're in the in the in the van. USD has been the world reserve currency since Bretton Woods. It's just got taken off the gold standard in 1971. Right. But still, like it was it was only given that world reserve currency status because it was, you know, backed by gold. Like if they were like, hey, we're gonna have the world reserve currency here but it's not going to be backed by gold i doubt anybody would have been like yeah okay whatever we're going to do trades over here with these guys and they're doing it in gold so i mean i think it had to be i think it had to go through that transition in order for it to occur that way all right just live in a van down by the river people don't want to cook i had too many green beans last year no one wanted them they would take tomatoes Wow, retype and still fail to correct the typos. <laughs> uh, Chris Farley knew the van life, yeah. Hello from Georgia. Well, hello, Georgia. We lost Chris Farley way too soon. I agree, we did. I want to provide homes so I can afford a big estate. <laughs> Don't hate me, hate the game. Yeah. My grandmother said to me not to give her farm animals nicknames. Why? Because in a week, or in a yeah, week months, they would be dinner. Yeah, and uh, I um, I did name some of the birds, but yeah, for the most part, I never named any of the farm animals. Um, and that was probably the reason why, you know, it was just like, you know, you don't want to give them a name and then like, you know, have to go, hey, we're eating, you know, eating <laughs> something that we gave a name to a pet, you know. And I never looked at, I never thought of the farm animals as pets. Like they were like, it, like, it was funny because like when we had a turkey, like I, I, like I felt bad, like the turkey almost became a pet. Like I mean, I love this damn turkey. It was cool, right? But you know, we we raised it for Thanksgiving dinner. It was, but like that's the thing you get end up kind of growing attached to some of these animals, especially ones that have like fun personalities or something. You know? Anyone tried plucking a chicken? It's not easy and takes ages. Absolutely, it does not do that. You're wrong. You got to get yourself a chicken plucker right and there they do exist and we had one it'll pluck a chicken in like 30 seconds the hardest part about plucking a chicken is um the feathers are really stuck they're st like you know young birds like the meat birds they're fairly easy but the older birds like if you have a laying hen or something like that once they get about six months old getting the feathers out of those birds is very difficult so what you have to do is you have to take a pot of water and get it up to 150 degrees that no more no less 150 degrees and you dunk that chicken for 30 seconds okay it doesn't take long soap in the water helps because it gets through the oils that are on the birds uh, feathers so you dunk that bird usually I got them by the feet and just dunk the whole bird 30 seconds count it out you get 30 seconds in 150 degree water and those feathers will practically wipe off the bird. It is, they come off so easy, so smooth, so clean. It'll, your birds will look like they came from the store. And then with the chicken plucker, that was pretty cool. It's like we, we had one that was made out of an old washing machine, but basically it was an old washing machine tub with a big flat plate on the bottom, right? So this big flat plate on the bottom spun. And then in the barrel, of this tub were a bunch of like rubber fingers that were about six inches long and they stuck out all around the tub right so it had all these fingers sticking out and then the plate it had the same rubber fingers on the bottom that would spin so as this chicken was spinning around in there these little rubber fingers that were all over it were pulling the feathers off of it you spray a little water in there and then it just rinse them all down and yeah we would butcher you know anywhere from 25 to 50 birds I mean, plucking was the easiest part of the whole thing, and I, I don't know, we would probably have that whole process done in maybe three hours, you know, three or four hours to, to process 50 birds. 
But yeah, without doing that, without the chicken plucker, without dunking them in hot water, God, it's a nightmare trying to trying to pluck all those feathers out. Did I get another super chat down there? Yes, I did. Thank you very much, uh, Vinny Grant, for the four ninety nine. Very cool of you. Blessings, UE. Did you see the U.S. Mint set 2023 Silver Eagle price at $80? Holy moly, no, I didn't. I missed that one. Gee whiz. That wasn't for, like, proofs or something? <laughs> All right. Hey there. Hey, there are opportunities everywhere. Yep. Yeah. All right. Cool story, though. All right. I feel sick. Oh, we're talking about the chickens? Yeah. Well, you can go and check it out. Like, I, I mean, if you go to um, Everyday Napa, Napa is spelled K-N-A-P-P-A, -P -P -A, Everyday Napa. It's my other YouTube channel, my farming one. I, I don't really post a whole lot there. Um, I should probably post more stuff there, you know. I think Freddie would like that. But uh, anyway, on that channel, I show my little hobby farm stuff that I used to do. And there the chicken plucking videos on there and the chicken evisceration videos on there. Show you how to process all the birds and stuff. All right. Uh, okay, question. Here we go. Prior, U.S. was the U.S. currency. How did that country provide to the whole world enough currency for the whole world? I mean, I think it was a little different back then. Like, uh, I, like the way we see it now, all these countries, all these people, everything were, you know, they're writing up contracts due in U.S. dollars. That's put a lot of demand for dollars that are going out there. The more this happens, the more demand for dollars are needed out there, the more you got to get that currency out to the rest of the people. You got to understand, like, you know, the world reserve currency was transactions between people, right? But then other nations and other corporations and other people started, you know, they write debts in dollars. That's more dollars that are needed, right? So it wasn't just a matter of like, say, doing currency swaps so that, you know, these countries have enough, you know, currency to facilitate the trade for buying oil or whatever. Now it's like an incredible amount because there's so many more people that are in demand of these dollars out there. So I think that's probably another way to kind of look at it is that, you know, there was a time when the other currencies were used, like, in not necessarily in the world trade fashion between nations, but maybe we're writing up contracts in their own sovereign nations or in their own sovereign currencies instead of U.S. dollars or something like that. All right. Uh, friendly Ghost, seven ninety nine. Thank you very much. Fraction of what's been saved just this week. Thank you. Also very cool to help motivated, smart young man get his channel cracking. All right. Well, that's, you know, that's always encouraging. I want to see people like, I try to get everybody to, to try and do a YouTube channel. Um, if nothing else, just to share their, you know, their experiences with their hobbies or something like that. I think it could benefit a lot of people. Um, you know, I mean, I, I understand like not everybody can, you know, bust out an economics channel from their car like that. I'm surprised that even happened, but you know, there's everybody out there has some information, you know, you got information that that you're good at, that's better than what other people have, you know, you might have information with baseball stats or something like that, or fishing or gardening or doing something like you have information that other people want, like they will, you know, and if you're entertaining with it, if you got attention and information, you can make money with that. So I encourage everybody to start a YouTube channel on their on the thing that interests them the most. Whether it takes off or not, who knows? But you don't know what it'll lead into. So, why do why people don't write up contracts in gold or silver instead? Because the the reason why they're writing up contracts in dollars is because they're going to get the best interest rate on that. All right. So, like with Evergrande, remember when we talked a lot about Evergrande, the property developer out in China? They most of their debt was in yuan. Right. It wasn't in, in dollars, but the, the the debt that was in dollars was like the the was the like premium debt. Right. So when they were borrowing in U.S. dollars, they were getting the best rate. Not only that, but it was also setting the stage like for what the rest of their debts would be. If the you know, if the dollar is the 
best deal, best interest rate, everything after that would be lesser, right? So that's like the establishment. If they can pay that debt, if they can pay, you know, their U.S. debt, well, then their credit rating is really good, right? So they'll get better, better ratings on the rest of it that's out there. So it wasn't just a matter of like just setting up like, you know, having make sure you got the, you know, the best credit ratings or whatever. It was the best deal that was out there, right, to to be able to borrow in that. But as far as like borrowing in gold, like you want to borrow in gold, like what kind of interest rate would be attached to that to be paid? Like you're going to get promised to get paid in gold and silver as opposed to dollars. Like you're taking on risk to do that. So you're going to want to you're going to want to have a higher interest rate to that. But if you're going to get paid in dollars, well, yeah, everybody accepts dollars. There's low risk, so the interest rate's better on it. That's the reason why, right? Establish good interest rates from that, and then your credit rating and everything else is going to provide you with better opportunities from that point on. All right, question. Why does feel entitled to have every single question answered? <laughs> well, it's... The uh, rest of them are statements, so I guess if some more people answer, ask questions, then he wouldn't be the one who was asking them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Or just write contracts, trading, commodity things. Again, <laughs> it's about the risk, right? I mean, to, to us, like, you know, to me, it's just like, hey, I want to get paid in gold. I like that idea. I'm totally down for it. But then what if you were going to get paid in gold and then had to transfer that gold into something else? So that you can do another purchase because the next purchase isn't going to accept gold, right? Well, then you get your gold and you realize, damn it, when I sold my gold off, I didn't quite get the dollars that I was hoping to get because now I need the dollars in order to make this purchase over there. I shouldn't have gotten gold in the first place, right? This is the problem. You, you, Everybody accepts the dollar, right? Now, granted, they could use anything. You can use you want. You can use Bitcoin. You can use gold. But who is going to accept that on the other side? Like, I got all my Bitcoin. Yeah, I did all my sales in Bitcoin. Hey, man, I need some oil. Well, you need dollars. No, I got Bitcoin. Well, you need to come up with dollars if you want our oil, right? But all I have is Bitcoin. You know, you see what's happening here? Everybody accepts dollars. Not everybody will accept Bitcoin. Not everybody will accept you want. Not everybody's going to accept rubles. But everybody will accept the dollar. And for most part, everybody will accept gold, but you're going to have to take a little bit of cut on that because there's storage fees and, you know, transportation fees and security fees and all kinds of other things that go with it. So now all of a sudden there's like cost associated with the no risk of having gold. Right. And then you got the, you know, whether or not it's going to actually sell for what you think it's going to sell for. So, again, like it's about ease, convenience. You know, there's other systems that are setting up that are going to compete with the communications that the Federal Reserve is using through the SWIFT system, right? So in order to facilitate the trade between these two nations, you have, you have to have the communications between them too, right? So it's like, it's pretty simple. You're going to fly a plane over there with the gold on it. How hard is that? Well, what if the transaction is faster than that, right? Like, you get it. By the time you get the gold, you've already sold the gold and it's gone to somebody else who's gone to somebody else. Like you can't make these transactions happen fast enough because you physically can't move it that fast enough. Right. So that's where the SWIFT system comes in again, where you have to have the communications and the clearings, you know, the clearing houses of all this stuff. So that isn't exactly something that can just be like, hey, let's just set it up and do something different. It has to be built like it has to be functioning and you have to have like confidence from the people to actually use it. So, like, everybody, like, they don't want to, but everybody trusts the United States. I don't know how many people out there really trust China and Russia. I mean, maybe more so now than they did, but, I, again, I think that people would probably be leaning more to trust the United States as opposed to trusting Russia or China. You know? But that, I guess that's my opinion, you know. What time is it? Oh, we got plenty. Okay, we've been out here for, oh, two and a half hours almost, two hours, 18 minutes. All right. Uh, what time to clear can be good and bad? The time to clear can be good and bad. Huh. All right. Uh, doesn't matter. The game is over. El Nino. El Nino is coming. I can never, you know, you've been with my channel since like day one, and I have never the. Cyrus 
I don't know how to say your name, bro, but you have been with the channel like since day one, and I'm pretty sure you have put a comment on every single one of my videos, man. Thank you for being here. <laughs> All right, question. 1928 US dollar says it is a gold certificate. Where do I go to redeem it for my gold? You can't. They entered that. They took that whole redeeming your certificates for gold. That's gone. That's not available to you anymore. However, if you have a decent gold certificate, then you might be able to sell it for more than the face value because really all you're going to get is the face value of gold. You're not going to get an actual set amount of gold. Um, so the silver or the gold certificate itself could be worth a lot more than the face value that you would get in gold. So, you know, you could just sell it for dollars or just keep it because it's a cool souvenir. Yeah. Cool collectible piece. All right. Question. How do you, oops, where'd you go? How do you feel about investing in agriculture as in buying fully functioning farms having a local expert maintain them, and then collecting small profits across time. Well, I mean, just like any business out there, if you can see, if you see the niche, go for it, man. I mean, if that's where, if that's where you can find it. I mean, you might, you know, you might find a fully functioning farm just, you know, east of Astoria here that's totally working, but the cost of it and the amount of produce that you can get off of it doesn't fulfill the, you know, the loan for the, for the farm or whatever. I mean, just like anything else out there, it's the buy box, right? Just like Lumberjack Landlord or Mike Zuber or anybody else says. You just punch the numbers in there, and if they all work out, then yeah, you buy it. If not, then hey, you got to move on to something else. So when it comes to farms, you end up with projections. Like, I'm going to grow this much stuff, and I'm going to be able to sell it for this much, and that's how much money I'm going to make. Well, that's a very tricky game to be in. I mean, I've told the story about the blueberry farmer here that... that uh, wanted to get into the cannabis industry, right? He has this blueberry farm. It's really only produces like for a short amount of time out of the year. He's thinking, man, I have to lay off my staff, my, my workers, you know, every season. I wonder if I got into cannabis, I could just have like a year round farming operation going and then I wouldn't have to lay these guys off. First year was awesome, right? He invests all this money into, into growing cannabis and you know does a does a great first year the next year the whole industry is absolutely flooded with cannabis he can't really move his product and his farm just about goes under right he's going back to just blueberries again because that's the only thing he can really do but now he has all this debt from investing into into growing cannabis that is not really the awesome business that a lot of people thought it was going to be i mean i said it from day one to I wouldn't touch a cannabis stock ever. Like that is a failing business as far as I'm concerned. And it's really, that's a difficult one for people to wrap their heads around because they're thinking, man, it's weed. It's expensive. Everybody buys it. It's like a drug, right? Why wouldn't it, why wouldn't it just like skyrocket in price and the problem or skyrocket in profitability, you know, as far as that goes. And the reason is, is that it's easy to grow, right? Granted, there are people out there who can grow good weed and good quantity of weeds and stuff like that, but it doesn't take a mental genius to do it. And that's really where the problem with, with the cannabis industry is, is that it can easily be flooded with product, right? From the consumer themselves to the manufacturers, the commercial guys, illegal, legal, whatever, it's a flood of, it's a sea of green out there. And if you have a flood of, of product, there's no way it's going to be profitable, right? And that's the problem with it. I remember the blueberry strains. Hey, thank you very much, Duncan, for uh, joining the channel. I very much appreciate that, man. I just, I really do appreciate that support. I do. Like, the every time I see another member hitting the channel and joining up, and you know, it's only a dollar a month, right? I mean, twelve dollars a year to to help su you know support the the uneducated economist YouTube channel. It's a very small price to pay, and I'm gonna, like I said, to try to bring some some benefit for for joining the uh, channel for being a member. You know, give you some exclusive videos, try and try to give you guys an exclusive live stream if I can figure that one out, and you know, just uh, try and give you like you know the early access. Try to give you some kind of perks for 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 you know for for supporting me in this. So thank you, thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, does the cannabis farmer friend of yours fish Bristol Bay too? First name start with L. I I 
I don't know him personally, so it very well could be that dude. I but I don't know him personally, so. Larry, Leo, oh, all right, welcome, Duncan. All right, in one of the last George Gammon videos, said that all we need, all we need, a ledge to make transactions, a ledger to make transactions, and money is not needed. Can you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, you think about it. I mean, I guess if you could wrap your head around Bitcoin. Like the idea of using Bitcoin, that's the same thing. That's the same thing of what George Gammon is talking about. It's just a ledger. It's a distributed digital. It's a <laughs> distributed digital digital ledger, right? It's it's as if everybody had a copy of all the transactions, and as you're looking at that copy. You can see the transactions occurring on it. And if you put a transaction on there, everybody else's copy sees it at the same time, right? So Bitcoin is very much like what George, I guess, is describing there, where it's just written down in a ledger. There's no actual physical anything trading, right? And including Bitcoin, although there is a certain amount of Bitcoin that transfers to another wallet, but it's not really going to anywhere. It's just being written down in this ledger. Right. That's it. It's just like, you know, the, the ledger says this wallet has this much in it. Like there is no physical wallet to go to. It's just on the ledger. That's it. And so that's like kind of I believe what George is trying to describe there is something very similar to Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin just facilitates it, makes it that much easier and streamlines it along with the other cryptocurrencies. But if you had like, you know, audits or whatever you could literally write it down on a piece of paper and do the exact same thing you know it just take forever it just wouldn't be very efficient that way bitcoin makes it efficient all right the u.s usually does well after war well yeah i mean think about it it's like if you if you destroy a house how much work is there to be done there like all of it there's a lot of work to go into rebuilding so after wars there's like all kinds of stuff to do you know it's before the war that's everything's expanded and now you can't really grow anything everybody's got everything they need and you know it's just luxuries and stuff like that there's no real like benefit to anything that anybody's doing but then when you destroy it all now you can produce stuff that people need and want and you know it's sad to say but yeah uh bitcoin is a modern day abacus yeah kind of is uh public ledgers with a set supply that can't be manipulated genius you know uh i just it's just a contract less agreement yeah you changed your have you changed your lifestyle given the current economic conditions well i changed my lifestyle but it was because I was forced to, right? I was a renter, you know, buy, and now I'm buying a house. So that's like a huge lifestyle change, right? going from being a renter to an owner. But it wasn't like necessarily by choice. I mean, I had to make the choice to buy the house, but it was either making the choice to stay in Astoria or leave Astoria. And so I decided to stay in Astoria. That's where the purchasing of the house came in. So the economic conditions forced that upon me. Yeah, I mean... You know, I could have done something different, but yeah, this was this was a change to my lifestyle. Now, me personally, in my financial decisions that I make, I'm still very frugal, right? Drive the old car, don't plan on getting another one. I mean, I'll get the Camaro someday, right? It's in the future. I um, I didn't take on any more debts. I don't have cable. I'm, I haven't had cable in I don't know how long. Like, we don't have it. Our TV only operates with DVDs and the kids, you know, video games. But that's the only time the TV is on is when we're watching a movie or playing a video game. Uh, there, there is no mindless TV playing in the background. We do not have that going. Um, so that's like a lot of that stuff. I haven't changed. I haven't changed anything about any of that stuff. Um, so, no. My economic life, my personal life, my financial life, 
is still pretty much being conducted the same way it always has. The only difference is, is now I'm living in my own house and buying it. And well, it's not mine yet. It's the banks, but I'm, I'm not renting. That's the only difference, you know, that, that I've seen. Um, but anything else I haven't changed much. All right. What do you do for a living? I do retail lumber sales for a living. I work at the local lumber yard and I sell two by fours and hardware for a living. Like literally stand at a counter and ring customers up. That's what I do. And then I also do like, I got some side gigs like the YouTube channel and I do uh, some entertaining on the weekends. I call a bingo game down at the local tavern, which if anybody is in the area wants to go see, you know, a fun bingo game, go and hang out for bingo. It's at the Workers' Tavern on Sundays starting at 6.30. So, yeah, come check me out. All right. Any opinions on buying and renting real estate and making a portfolio in multiple countries? I can afford to buy and renovate on one elite apartment every two years. No loans required. Well, I mean, again, that's, I mean, it's your buy box, right? Fill in the little spots, you know, here's my cost, here's my projection of rent and all the other things that are going to go into it. And at the end of it, if that's your number, go for it, man. I mean, everybody's got to find their niche. If you can find, find it in multiple countries, if you can find it all in one county, you know, I mean, that's, that's the niche. I mean, it's, I mean, as far as my opinion on it, having like rentals in many countries that's difficult. What if, like, you got to have, like, property management? What if your renter calls up and says, hey, man, I got a leak? You know, what do you, what do, you do about it? You're over here, and they're way over there, you know? So how do you deal with that? I mean, if you got, maybe you maybe your niche has figured that out. You got a guy over there. You got, you know, property maintenance people who deal with these things. Cool. Like, I mean, you that's, that's awesome. I think it's actually pretty cool to have something that you own that's outside of the United States. Like, that to me is pretty cool. Like that's a neat, neat, neat feature to have within your portfolio. Um, you know, there was a time when I had a, a gold money account and I kept gold. I had a gold account with money sitting in like Canada and some over in like, I don't know, Switzerland or something like that. Like I had like just a little bit of gold and I just wanted it because I thought it would be cool to have something that's outside of the United States. But I wasn't like serious about it. I just wanted it for fun. You know? Anyway, uh, just trying to decide where to invest for the first time. Wow. Um, investing for the very first time. Yeah. Um, boy, that's again, I think that's going to be like your personal personal niche that you're going to find. You know, a lot of people will go into stocks. Some people will go into you know, maybe purchasing bonds or like, you know, CDs or something like that, or something really simple, you know, you got to think what's an investment, you know, an investment is something that is going to give you a return of some sort. Like if you're buying gold, that's a speculation, right? Which it still might be like an investment for you because you can sell it off in the future or you're buying like a gold miner or something like that, which you're anticipating the company is going to grow. You could be buying into, you know, Different things that, you know, are are going to have that return. Rental incomes, dividend paying stocks, the businesses, yourself, like investing in yourself to do something like your own business. You know, that's a that's a that's probably one of the best places that you can ever invest. So it's hard to say, you know, you have to find your niche. You have to, you know, figure out what it is that you feel comfortable with and that, you know, like I wouldn't. I wouldn't invest off of the information that you get from a YouTube video unless you like been following that guy for a long time and you really understand what it is that he's trying to explain or you see it for yourself in that in that light. But you know, you that person on the YouTube channel doesn't know you. They don't know your condition, they don't know what your needs and expectations out of life are. How is it they could possibly suggest something to you through a video? Like that's like that's not possible. You know, they have to know you personally and you have to know yourself and you have to know what it is that you need in life. And so between all that, there's going to be a lot of different ways that you can invest your money. All right. Playing for bacon. That's right. We're playing for bacon. I miss meat bingo. Yeah. It's fun. We do it every Sunday, you know. 
you have a long time horizon, you should go into stocks. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think stock, like especially if you're young, the younger you are, because you got time to write it out. Like if you happen to buy in during a time when you know the markets take a hit or something, if you're young, you can just basically just ignore it for a while, you know, and just wait for it because eventually it will come back. Like there's never been a great crash without a great rise or something coming after it. It never just falls and then stays down forever. Like it might stay down for a while, but not forever. So being young is really the best place in the the best time that you can be buying stocks because you can ride through the, you know, through the ups and downs of it. If you're 70, 80 years old and you're in the stock market, that's really nerve wracking because you can watch half your money disappear and then you're like, man, what do I do for the rest of my life? You know? So yeah, young, definitely in the stocks. All right. I have a minivan that I gave to a friend who has a car rental business through Turo makes me at least five hundred dollars a month. Vehicle worth thirty five thousand. Good deal. That's right. Uh, uh, BMW is making things like heated seats, heated screens, electric seats. A part of the subscription extra you have to pay, even though you own the car outright. Yeah, and see that's where like that's where I find like. The whole idea of you own nothing and be happy, it's stuff like that that has taken place when, like, I own my car, I'm happy, I'm cool, right? I'm, you know, maybe someday it'll stop running and I won't have it anymore, but I'm happy with this. I would not be happy having to pay a monthly fee to have a particular feature work on my car. That would not make me happy. That would make me very upset. However, I think that's the type of thing that is coming to everything out there. Like, you can buy it, You'll get most of the features, but if you really want to unlock the rest of it, it's going to cost you every month, right, in order to, to get that. And I think that's going to happen with a lot of stuff, TVs, you know, phones, all kinds of stuff. You know, you, you can buy it, you'll get most of it, but then if you want to unlock the rest of it, it's going to cost you. All right. Um, do you provide purchasing power to a ledger? Because... It is just numbers, no gold or something that can provide value. Um, I'm not sure what the... Okay. How do you provide purchasing power to a ledger? Because it's just numbers, no gold or something that can provide value. Okay. I think... I think that the... The understanding of what currency is supposed to do. Right? Because... The currency isn't supposed to be a value. It's not supposed to be a store of value. It's right. It's meant. It's meant to facilitate the trade. You know, to provide a service for a good. We we get this transaction between us. How do you do that? Right. That's what the currency is for. It's to facilitate that trade between us. The currency itself, like you grab a hold of that currency, and you and you hold on to it. Well, the value of that can move quite quickly. And that's not what its intended purpose was. It was to facilitate this trade between us. So when we facilitate the trade and you get get the money and you're thinking, well, I'm going to hold on to this. Well, that's not what that was, was intended for, right? Now, we misunderstand that because there was a time when we had gold and silver in the, in the, in the system. And that's the way which you would do, you know, you would facilitate this trade, you would have the gold and you would try and stack up on all this gold because you would be able to preserve your purchasing power with it. But that's not the case anymore. So back in the day, we had money that acted as a currency. Now we have currency, but that's not the same as money, right? That It doesn't have a store of value like money did. So that's the difference within it. It's like, it's just the same as Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't need to have a value to it. It just needs to facilitate that trade. Right, and once we have facilitated the trade, it's not meant to be held on to. Although a lot of people hold on to Bitcoin right now because, you know, who knows what it's going to do. But it's not really meant to be that store of value. I mean, not in my opinion, it's not meant to be a store of value. It's meant to be the facilitator of the trade, right? To to make the transactions happen. And so, yeah, that's you know, so there doesn't need to be like the currency itself doesn't really need to have any value in order to facilitate the trade itself. But the trade needs to have value. Like what I'm trading for what you're trading, right? Those two things need to have value. How we trade that doesn't really need to be because it, the the facilitator of the trade, the currency, 
doesn't have the value. I have the value, you have value, let's switch this out, and this is the way we do it, is with this currency. But the currency itself doesn't have value, get rid of that as soon as you're done with the trade, right? You know, gotta, gotta put that into something else. Does that help? Does that kind of, <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's the way I see it, anyway. Alright. Uh, back down. I gave all my CDs and DVDs to those less fortunate. Yeah, a friend of mine pitched all her. She took all her all her CD music CDs and threw them away. And I was like, "Whoa, why'd you do that?" She goes, "You don't need them anymore. You know, you got all your music on your phone. You know, it's just like she didn't need them, so she just got rid of them all. She said she hadn't played CDs in forever." All right. Hang the CDs. Yeah, that was that was what somebody else said. You were like, no, use those CDs for bird deterrent, for to bird to scare off birds, you know, from the eaves of your house or the garden or whatever. Okay. Um, it's only trust in currency is what makes it valuable. There is therein is the big lie. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the advice, brother. I'll try to listen as often as I can. Well, thank you very much, you know, and again, like, I'm not necessarily trying to give advice. I'm just trying to give my opinion so that you can use this information with your other information that you're getting from all the rest of the places that you're searching for, for information from. I mean, I'm just like a small piece in the puzzle, like with my opinions and stuff and the information that I come up with. But really, it's just it's just a part of the bigger picture of what you're trying to figure out for your own life and the decisions that you need to make with it. Um but I appreciate it, you know, I, I appreciate you guys listening, and, and, you know, if you take the advice, I mean, cool, I'm glad you found found it useful um, and, and helpful, but again, like, I'm not trying to give, like, financial advice or anything like that, or investing advice, I'm just trying to explain the economy the best that I see it, and tell you guys what I'm doing, like, you know, I'll let you know, like, how it is that I'm placing my money or the things that I invest in, um, you know, for most of you know that I've been pretty much just trying to stack cash as much as possible because I just think that the buying opportunity is coming like next year, like six months to a year. I think you're going to find some serious buying opportunities like in stuff like used cars. I think you're really going to find it. That's what I'm hoping that, you know, that Camaro becomes available to me, right? That I'll be able to, uh, I mean, I don't, want to see people crying in the streets but i want to see somebody crying in the streets that they have to get rid of their camaro and that's going to be my buying opportunity right that's the you know if i get it if i feel like because you know, what i think is probably going to end up happening is that time is that i'm going to be like in the same position as everybody else going no way man this is so freaky i'm not dumping any of my money i'm keeping all my cash because i don't know what the future is going to be like and then i'll miss out on my buying opportunity to get the camaro cheap right <laughs> because that's how Human nature ends up going. You got to fight against your instincts, right? You know, be greedy when people are fearful and fearful when people are greedy. All right. Um, are you not entertained? <laughs> what, is somebody giving me a hard time about this or something? All right. Uh, question. Man, you're, I, I love it, man. Okay. Uh, question, why the Roman Empire used gold and instead of big wall with a big wall with a ledger instead, they did not know that. Well, they might have actually had a ledger. They used script, you know, they used like uh, they used bank notes like to 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 transfer trade like from clearing houses. Um, but really didn't. Didn't a lot of the Roman Empire, especially towards the end, weren't they using like steel for for their for their coinage? In fact, it wasn't I doing that. In fact, I was reading that the other day in Cantillon's essay that that ended up being a major problem for them because like all they had to do was just come up with an iron mine. They were like making these iron coins, and then these other nations figured out that they could just mine their own iron and. Uh, start buying up all the all the commodities and stuff of of the empire and basically just counterfeited the money right and this took all their stuff and now what are you going to do about it right so they started like doing things to the money to 
to screw it up. Like they added vinegar or something to it and then it made it like really useless for anything else. They really screwed with their currency there towards the end. It was really messed up. So yeah, I bet you they wish they had something like a Bitcoin ledger that they could write it all down with. I listen to all my music free on my phone. Movies ever heard of Tubi? Nice spam. Okay. Uh, no, just a movie quote from. Okay. Why make Spotify richer when you can own something physical? Right. Um, because of the convenience. Right? Because of the convenience of it. Why own a car when. You can just tap on your phone and somebody will just come and pick you up and take you wherever you want to go. And then you don't have to worry about maintenance or gas or insurance or being damaged, you know. I mean, that's probably the worst part about owning a car is that it's, you know, a magnet for for getting damaged. All right, dude, how don't you take a pee break? I'm telling you, man, it's getting pretty close to the end right now. I was going to try and push it to three hours and... I'm having a hard time finishing this cup of coffee because of it. All right, I'd be running. <laughs> Seriously, with 10 cups of Joe? Yeah. Um, towards the end of the empire, steel was really valuable. Yeah. Question, when are you going to make more videos for your members? I'm gonna try and do, I, I I was going to do one today, but I got, I had, uh, never mind, excuses. Um, I'm going to try and do one at least once a week. If not, I'll do two, right? Um, so that's, that's what my goal is, is to try and at least do one video a week. I'm going to try and do it like on a Friday or something to try and make it consistent for the members. So, you know, like I said, try to give some perks. Um, I haven't done it with every video, but I try to give, um, the members early access to the videos before I make them public so I'll, I'll post them up on my YouTube channel and you know usually I'll get you know anywhere from a dozen to 20 or 30 views before I'll before I make it public and so you can I don't know if that's like a perk or not but it's like you know a nice little feature that you get for being a member of the channel anyway so um, at least once a week that's that's that that's my goal i didn't achieve it this week i'll put out a video maybe tomorrow for the members um and and have that done uh for you guys so anyway and if you have any other suggestions like i like the idea of doing um you know a members only live stream um and then maybe even conduct it through zoom um and that way we can uh you know, bring other people, like bring maybe some of the guests in to ask questions and stuff like that, and maybe make it a little bit more uh, interactive for the viewers and stuff like that. I think that would be a lot of fun. All right. Um, a pot to piss in. Chris Harley. Okay. And the convenience is all about why we're going to own nothing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Did you hear about the guy that left dead fish at the Goonies house? Yeah, that guy was a trip. You know, people were asking, why? What was up with the fish? Why did he do the fish? And it's because Astorians are crazy, right? The It's pretty cool living in Astoria and kind of being a little nutty myself is because not only do I fit in around here, but then I'm not even really noticed when you have so many crazy people who are around here. Like... It's funny, the guy left the fish, like some random dude decides that he's going to leave a fish up at the Goonies house, right? He just leaves this fish on the porch, like, you know, so that it would rot and stink and be a, I guess he was just trying to be a jerk or whatever. And nobody was surprised by it. Like, we were all like, you know, laughing and joking about it. It was like, oh, he left a fish up there? Yeah. But what we were more interested in is that later that dude went and stole a boat and ended up getting it like... <laughs> He's out in the bar there, had to get rescued by the Coast Guard, and the boat got taken out by the damn by the damn surf. But they didn't know he was like in trouble for like putting this damn fish up there. So this guy's like running amok. They bring him back, like had him checked into the hospital. He was like, Hey, I'm okay. They're like, Yeah, you okay? He checks himself out of the hospital, ends up like over a couple of towns away at a warming center. And that's where the cops finally caught up to him. It was just like, you know, he was like sitting at a warming center in another town. You know, it was just, this is the way, like, this is pretty typical behavior of historians. 
Anyway. And nobody could figure out what the whole point of the fish was. And it was just like, none of us really was like, what do you mean? The point of it was so that it would sit up there and stink. Why, why else would he do it, you know? All right. Where can we send you the questions and you turn those questions into a video for the members? Oh, that's good. Um, Maybe in the subject line, right, you know, members question. And send a question to the uneducated economist at gmail.com. Right, question What happens if the boomers move all their money into long dated bonds and yields are high? While the yields are high. I I mean that's I mean that's kind of, how do you answer that question? I mean, it's a completely hypothetical situation. If all the baby boomers started moving all their money into the bonds, then all the yield would come out of it. You know, the prices would go up and the yields would fall. So it wouldn't be high yields. Like you can't, like, I don't think it would happen that way. Zoom. I'm not saying I'm bored to tears. I'm not. I'm just saying I discovered I can arrange mini pretzels as a game of galaxies and play rounds on my desk he capsized the boat yeah he did they actually um and it was the guy who rescued if i remember right the when the coast guard crew went out there the guy who was doing the rescuing that was his very first rescue that he had ever done so that was it must have been pretty exciting for him. You know, guy wasn't from Astoria. He is a Canadian. Yeah, nobody from Astoria is from here. Like, I mean, a handful of people are, but everybody came here from someplace else. Uh, where can we send... Oh, we already did that one. Okay. Um, don't let him near Guam. That island may capsize too. Yeah. I remember when I went to Canada in this bar this guy i was talking to told me he got chased by the cops for being dui and he tried to flee but got his leg caught in the seatbelt. bummer so when is the inflation going down like you said buddy okay so you're not seeing all the articles talking about the disinflation and how inflation is starting to come down i mean you know, here's the thing. I was talking to a guy earlier today about uh, about issues that you know you find out there in the world, right? And um, he was basically talking about his his business and the competition, and he's talking about all this competition that's all of a sudden starting to pop up all around him. And you know, and I said to him, and I said, you know, there's always going to be competition. You know, and if you're doing good, then people are going to try and copy that because, you know, they want to be successful just like you are, especially if they see you being successful. And I said, now, competition has always been there, but you're noticing it more, so you're seeing it more. And he tried to defend that, saying, no, no, there's all this stuff. And I said, listen, man, it's from oh, it was Tony Robbins, I think, is a um, motivational speaker. And he's and he, for the crowd, one day, he says to him, he goes, I want you to count, look around the room and count everything that is brown. Everything in the room that is brown, find all the brown things, start counting for brown, right? So, you know, the whole rooms, they're all counting for brown. And then he says, okay, now, I want you to do the exact same thing again, only this time, I want you to look for red, right? So he starts, everybody starts looking for red, looking for red, looking for red. Now, everybody had the same answer when he asked, how many people found way more red than they did brown, right? Everybody found way more red. And he was just like, now, how many people counted this lady's burgundy shirt as red, right? Everybody in the room put their hand up as red. He goes, it's not red, it's burgundy, but you wanted to see it as red because you wanted to count it as red. So you saw it that way. And that's the way inflation is as well, right? You don't want to see it. You want to see me being wrong. And so therefore, you don't want to see anything out there that is showing signs of a deflationary situation or a disinflationary situation, right? All you want to see is how wrong I am and how inflation's not going to come down. Well, then you're going to see that. You're going to find all the articles for it. You're going to find all the stuff that, you know, confirms your bias on that, right? That's what's going to happen. Right or wrong, right? That's what that's what will be. 
Well, same thing if you go the other way with it. If you want to see all the signs of disinflation, well, then you can look for it. Look at house prices are starting to show their way coming down, right? They're not going up as fast as they were. Lumber has certainly come out of its all-time highs and now back down to normal. But we don't want to talk about those things. We only want to talk about how eggs are expensive now and how you go down to the grocery store and you can't afford to afford anything down there. But yet the prices are coming out. Eggs are going to be coming up cheaper now that the wholesale prices have collapsed, right? Just, I mean, if you want to see inflation, you will find it. If you want to see disinflation, you will find it, right? I mean, but whether or not you want it is a different question of what is actually happening out there. So look for red, you'll see red. Right? Uh, when do some, wait, will you do some day whiteboard video like George? Um, you know, I thought about it doing whiteboards, but I just kind of wanted to keep the channel kind of consistent to what I had originally started. Occasionally I'll use some visuals and stuff, but I really, I wanted the channel to be more audio, like more about the things that I'm saying than about the visuals that I put out there. Um, it wasn't because I wanted to also have a podcast that went with it, but really I think that was kind of like what got me into just trying to stick to audio is that if I ever did want to move it into like a podcast, then I couldn't really have visuals for a podcast, right? I would have to be just strictly audio. So that was one of the reasons why I didn't really use the whole whiteboard or use a lot of visual or edits or anything like that. It's because of the future possibility of having a, a being just strictly a podcast or something like that. Even though I never really intended that, I just guess it was in the back of my mind. All right. Thoughts on Americans disposable income lowest since the 1932 yeah, um, I love that term, disposable income, you know, it's like the, I mean, you just throw it away, you know, <laughs> whatever. Thank you for the five, uh, four ninety nine, uh, John, very much appreciate that. Um, isn't it funny how just a couple of years ago, they were talking about how we, you know, Americans had the highest savings that they had in years. It just kind of goes to show that stimulus, right? The stimulus kind of loaded everybody up with a bunch of money. Um, as far as like Americans being able to go off, acquire like a decent amount of savings from a regular job, I don't I don't think that's going to happen anymore. Like you got to think back in the 30s, you know, depression era type of stuff, you know, a few years after that, we were moving into the highest standard of living a few decades anyway, you know, we were moving into the highest standard of living. So if you're starting off from like dirt poor, Right, and you don't have anything. Well, everything's an opportunity from that point on. Right, but now we've gone from having like a high standard of living that it's getting difficult to maintain that standard of living, and you're not going to find like all the opportunities in the world. You're going to have less opportunities coming from that. So I think that's the kind of a big difference in the two. You know, from like the thirty twos on, where we were going from like the depression. Now we're going into the like into the depression. You know? All right. The price of whiskey has been consistent for three years. Whiskey is not a necessity. Food service and housing is some with cars. Plus, the economy was largely shut down. Nothing to spend money on. <laughs> All right. If we have more immigrants, more people coming to the country, is that a way to decrease inflation? Because... Will we will have more demand for dollars in circulation? I think if you have more immigrants coming into the country, if those people are working, those people would be debt free at the time that they come here giving them opportunity to take out debts that are n like they're not in a debt saturated position like most americans are debt saturated right they can't take on any more debt they can't afford any more payments at the end of the month but if you just moved here and you just got a job and you don't have any debt burden yet well that's a nice opportunity for you guys, for them to start taking out money, right? To start borrowing money and spending into the economy, to start buying the houses and cars and going on vacation with and stuff. So 
that could be, you know, a fairly inflationary act if the, you know, if that was to happen. I don't know. Uh, let's see, because we will have more dollars in the ass. So. Hi from... Hi from Hano or Hanoi, Vietnam. Very cool. I hate that saying disposable income. Yeah, I do too. I like I'd never like disposable income, like money you can just toss away or something. People can die from quitting drinking cold turkey. That's true. I've seen it happen. Whiskey may very well be a necessity. Yeah, I guess in that sense it could be. Um yeah, I've seen, uh, yeah, I, I, I know a guy who died from detoxing and that was, that was wild. Um, that was really wild. All right. Um, all right, guys, I'm going to give it like another five minutes here and then I'm going to head home because it's been three hours that i've been out here you guys are so awesome 169 of you watching right now 248 likes have 55 dollars in super chats you guys are always so generous for the channel like i just really appreciate it all so all right uh neighbor for the win pictured in the ad a gallon of milk a loaf of bread and a carton of eggs unused french toast kit 300 dollars or best offer don't lowball me. I know what I got. <laughs> All right. Corvette C8 is still way above manufacturer suggested retail price. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Social Security, as it currently is in relation to population, is absolutely unsustainable at our current trajectory due to depopulation. Um, it's not unsustainable in the sense that they can pay out the checks, like the social security checks will go out. I think the major problem with it is, is that the purchasing power of those checks can, cannot be promised. Right. But they can promise to pay them like that, that part I'm, I'm, I know for sure that they will not fail on, like they will pay those social security checks, but as far as what those security checks, those social security checks can actually purchase, that's that's going to be a whole other story. Like you might get your check, but then you won't be able to do anything with it. You go know, buy a loaf of bread or something, you know, which would be the same thing as as being unsustainable. So, uh, all right, this is the nineteen eighties all over again. I remember films on the 80s when Miami Vice was big it was about controlling the drug imports and making it look rich yeah got any plans for the weekend uh what do we have planned oh uh, I guess the um, baseball tryouts are tomorrow so Freddie's gonna go try that out he's never played baseball but he's really excited about that a lot of his friends are doing it so he did really well in basketball so Hopefully, he'll have the same amount of fun in baseball. So, we're doing that tomorrow. Uh, and then I'm not sure what else we're going to do. What's up with palladium? Used to be higher than gold. I don't know. Palladium's a... That's an interesting metal. Um, you know, people ask me all the time about, like, purchasing palladium or platinum or something. And I do have a 10th ounce platinum coin. Um, but I'm not a big fan of palladium and platinum for... Uh, for like, for the insurance policy, like silver can do, and the reason why I say that is that if you have a silver coin, and you go into just about any town anywhere in this country, you're probably going to find somebody who's going to give you some money for that coin, right? For that twenty dollar, you know, twenty five dollar ounce of silver, and you go to the pawn shop, go to the bar, go to the jeweler, you know, somebody's probably going to give you a little bit of money for that twenty ounce or for that. For that one ounce um, silver eagle platinum not so easy like going into the bar everybody's like not everybody but people might recognize silver be cool with it but as far as platinum goes that might be a little more concerning to them um 
trying to find that buyer, like especially for palladium. Like I don't know if I've ever even actually seen palladium like in my hand. Like actually no, Scott did have a palladium coin one time. So yeah, I have seen a palladium coin, but that it, it's like so rare. Like, you know, the chances of finding somebody who's like, "Oh yeah, I'll buy that." I mean, that's not very likely. The likelihood of somebody buying silver, very high. So that's like kind of the difference that I see inside of the two. Um, and then the industrial demand buy, because really platinum and palladium are more industrial demand kind of, or industrial metals. So really you have to know the in industries, the mining, the you know storage level, stuff like that, in order for it to be like investment or speculation kind of thing. Um, so I don't see those two nearly on the same as I do silver. I think silver is a much better insurance policy. All right. Okay, guys, it is after three hours now, so I am going to head on home. I really appreciate you all hanging out. I really appreciate all the likes. You guys, you know, hit that thumbs up. That's what helps spread the videos around. You're very supportive of the channel, everything you do. I can never thank you guys enough. There's no inflation. Just ask yourself why there are so many homeless in Portland and Seattle. Okay, there's so many there's because of the new money that is poured into the system due to the fact that there is a... It's, it's gentrification on a major scale, right? So as the new money was pouring in, as people who have the money are enjoying the luxuries of life, they're enjoying those conveniences, they're enjoying everything that... They enjoyed when they lived down in L.A. or when they lived up in Seattle or wherever it was that they, you know, decided that they were going to bring this new money here from. Right? So now they have these conveniences. They enjoy it here. And now, like, the apartments go up in price, right, because of all these new conveniences that are brought in, these expensive ones. Right? Working at the coffee shop is no longer, you know, something that can sustain the apartment and everything that goes with it, right? So as the new money continues to pour in, you get the separation between the rich and the poor. And as that separation starts to happen, you find more and more people unable to work and provide for themselves the, you know, the way of life that they once enjoyed. So now they're in their cars or they're in a tent, right? They're, they end up like, you know, on the streets because of this. And it's not like everybody wants to blame it on like, you know, the liberal, you know, politicians or something like that. Well, they certainly don't make it any easier. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, deny that. I mean, they, you know, some of the decisions that they're making, even like the ones that we've seen just recently with, you know, spending how much money, like you know, $46,000 per person to put them up in a house for a year. I mean, it was just like, you know, I don't even know if that math works out right. But this is the type of stuff. Like if you have people who have so much money that they're willing to dump it into the idea of buying or buying rent for people so that they have a place to live. Think about how much money that is that these people have as far as being able to dump that in to their society in order to have the convenience of not looking at ugly homeless people. I mean, that's really like, you can say it like that. There is so much money in Portland that they are now willing to dump that money, like to buy the convenience of not having to look at homeless people anymore. And that's how, that's how much the wealth gap has, has now taken place. It's spread all the way out here to Astoria. I mean, we experience it here. This used to be a working class town. It's not a working class town anymore. It's like turning into a retirement village. So all this like, you know, retirement money and you know, whatever is like coming. It's just like, it's changed the way the town is. Like we have this huge hospital district now and, you know, I see homeless people more now than we ever. When I was growing up, we had one homeless dude that ran around town. His name was Lance. Two buck Lance is what they called him because he had asked for $2 because that's how much it costs to go down and get a Whopper from Burger King. Right. Two buck Lance was the only homeless person that anybody knew around here. Now it's like a whole community of them. There's tons of them all over the place. And that's going to grow. It's going to get worse. So, like, you think Portland's bad now? There is nothing they can do to change this. This is going to get worse, right? The only the only thing that could possibly change it is going into a depression and put everybody into poverty. And then we can all, you know, everybody from that point on can then start growing from there. I'm not saying that's a good thing. But as far as, like, fixing the homeless problem in Portland, never going to happen. Never 
gonna happen like you can clean it up and force them out and shove them away and make them go disappear and stuff like that 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 can happen and then you won't see them anymore but does that like take care of the homeless problem they take care of your homeless problem seeing them but it doesn't take care of like you know these people had to just go someplace else because you ran them off right i mean like here in Astoria, like right where i'm at right here in astoria i'm behind the place where i work there used to be tents everywhere back here there was rvs and tents and cars and all kinds of stuff they're not here anymore I watched the cops harass these people every single day. When I was out here, I would see it happen every single time I would come out here and make a video. I'd watch the cops make the rounds and, and run the people off. Like, you can't camp here. You can't be here. You're lawyer, whatever. And so they run them off to a new spot. Where they went, I don't know, right? But here in a couple of months, I would imagine they'd be coming back, right? Because where are they going to go? They don't have any place to be. So there is no fixing that. Like, you know... It, I, I don't I don't know what it is like people ask me all the time you come up with all these things but you never come up with a solution there is no solution there's no solution to it it's just a matter of understanding that this is the situation in which it is and you got to conduct yourself within it like the homeless problem is going to be a bigger problem next year and the year after that right and it's in the separation is just going to get worse right the only thing they can do to try and hide that is to bombard us with a bunch of cheap conveniences right that's why i think the society is going to end up the way it is with more of individualism as opposed to family formations right everybody's just going to be the individual how do i you know find my food how do i find my ride how do i find my you know whatever and you're just going to do it all off of a cell phone and all the conveniences are just going to be brought to you not realizing that you're being separated, you know, from the higher elitists out there. And then one day you wake up and you're like, man, you know, there used to be a time when people owned houses and cars and stuff and things. Now all we have is this clothes on our cell phone. Weird, right? And that's the way life is going to end up being. All right, I got to go, guys. Uneducated economist, thank you so much for hanging out. I really appreciate it. You guys are absolutely the best. You let me know.